Hello, everybody, and welcome to another PMP end of month review. Why? What is the PMP? Well, that's our painters, motivating painters, uh, our Facebook group where we focus on helping you take your next hobby step. Uh, so, as usual, we're going to sit here for quite a while because yet again we have another really big month, uh, and we're going to I'm going to review the miniatures that were submitted, uh, give some feedback in a targeted way. Uh, how the painters have asked for. As always, if you want to join us on your hobby journey, you can look right down there uh, in the description and there's a link to join. You must answer all of the questions. If you do not answer all the questions, you won't get approved, you won't get in. Answer all the questions. Okay, so uh, that being said, every month we open up a new event uh, specific to the month in question. So in this month is the May event. You can find that within the Painters Motivating Painters group under the Events tab. And you can post your picture there. We invite people to put, to put uh, one miniature that is completed, finished project in there and ask for targeted feedback. So please uh, list what you'd like feedback on. It's very helpful. If you can bullet point that or call it out, it helps a lot. I know people like to write a lot about what they're doing, but keep in mind, I have to read 80 to 100 of these. And so when you write me a novel, it doesn't help. I need to be able to see what you're asking for feedback on. Quickness is the key, folks. Uh, so, you know, be clear, be uh, targeted, and that really helps me help you uh, with the best information I can. Okay? So for now, we're going to keep on reviewing everyone. We'll see how much this keeps growing. We're going to hit a point where I can't review all of these, and we'll have to see what we can do. But for now... We're going to keep on it. So uh, without further ado, uh, I just want to say at the top, thank you to everybody who submitted a lot of great stuff this month. I'm really excited to go through this. Uh, and we're going to take a look at everything and, and give the feedback we can give. So let's jump right into it. Okay, so up on the screen here, we have our first submission. This is from Joel, new to the group, first time posting. Well, welcome. And wants some feedback on his latest mini. Uh, started his, came back to the hobby almost two years ago. And he's only, you know, he's not painting a lot of minis. He's really trying to push himself with, uh, with every one. And so he's looking for display quality and wants some feedback. Sure. So here's what I'll say right now. As it stands, uh, I can tell that you're, you have, we have a very GW influenced style. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, my best advice for you when we're looking at sort of where I would push this. So a couple things. One, your black highlights are too flat in that they're just white to, to black and they're too small in the volume. We need to expand this out and go through an interference color. Black almost always has an interference color. Oftentimes it's going to be a deep turquoise or blue or something like that. That's very common for a lot of these types of marines. So you want to expand that volume here of like this highlight out and make sure it's nice and smooth. Uh, I Also your white looks a little chalky so you may want to think about adding something like a mixing your white with a gloss varnish. That'll really help smooth out that white. The other thing that jumps out at me here is on the face. The face is very monotone. So uh, adding more colors, more tones in the face, more reds, more blues, more yellows, browns. Like there's lots of different segments and, and sections of the face. Uh, it's a really, really important sort of area. Uh, I'll have a video coming out about it sometime in the next several weeks. So you can always watch that. I actually do a space brain head. So uh, I would recommend you check that out. I've, I've talked about faces in a couple past videos but this is the first time i'm directly addressing like male space marine type heads uh but yeah i would say like more red in the cheeks more blue down here if he has you know a, a, a beard stubble or on the back of his head where he shaved his head or just brown tones to represent tan or red tones in the in the uh temples and across the here and in the center of the the forehead you know faces need a lot of color those are the big things that jump out to me hope that helps joel great stuff though i i love that you're taking your time and really making these beautiful it is a great work Next up, Ace. So Ace says, just some overall feedback in general. Where can he improve with the overall composition and final details? Sure. So the biggest thing that jumped out to me when I looked at this, Ace, was uh, just the sort of... I like the weathering. I think that looks really nice. This sort of uh, old Death Guard type scheme with the rust and the scratches. So I think that looks nice, but it doesn't carry through. So we have some weathering and stuff on the white, but it doesn't really carry through to the copper and to the green as much as I would like. Uh, that is to say, I don't see any really like verdigris or heavy rust on the metals. And what you're telling me from the cream color is that this guy is really weathered 
And yet, these other elements, I mean, there's a little bit of verdigris like here and here, here and here. It's, it's very, very minimal. So I would really focus on, you know, same with the weapon and stuff like that. My next step for you would be if you're going to do these kinds of Nurgle-ish figures where mm -hmm. they're showing this heavy weathering and wear and tear to go back and look at a lot of the videos I have on, you know, heavy weathering and, and think about how you'd integrate those. Same thing with like around the feet, integrating pigment and dirt and dust. This guy clearly doesn't clean himself up much. So those kinds of elements are going to really go far. The other thing that pops out at me is the separation of elements is a little weak. So I'll give you an easy example to know what I'm talking about. Let's take this, these copper elements against this green. See how we don't have a, uh, a really deep line separating these two. In fact, we got a little copper bleed. Here we've got a little green bleed. You want to have a really nice dark separation in between all of the elements. So everything feels very separated. Same with like the plates down here. Um, some places there are like around the knee, probably because that's an easy place for sort of a wash to settle in. But when we don't have a place like that, we've got to go in and actually create those lines. So that's my feedback for you on that one. Okay, next up, Brian, looking for some general feedback, particularly on the modulation shading and the weathering. Uh, he said it's really hard to blend metallics, and that is true. It can be a real challenge. Uh, so I don't know what metallics you're using, Brian. Obviously, I recommend Vallejo Metal Color and mixing it with, which is this stuff, just so we're all absolutely clear. I don't mean air. I don't mean model. I mean this right here. Uh, that mixes really well with regular matte paints or inks or stuff like that. You can mix them directly in. You can do them as glazes on top. And I find it really helps. And it will make these kinds of tasks like creating the type of shading you're trying to get here a little easier. And I would say that, yes, the steel as it stands right now does feel a little flat. Now, the panel modulation and lighting on the rest of the miniature, I actually don't uh, mind at all. I think it looks rather nice. So the pink and the purple feel a lot better than the steel color. Uh, so I think that's probably where your challenge is going to be. Uh, I would go back and watch the shading true metallic metals revisited video that I did. Uh, and because that really shows how I actually will mix in matte paints to create, you know, new metallics and new colored metallics. And I think that could really help, uh, because you can, you can combine that with the traditional sort of glazing of inks. When you're working with metal colors, it is a lot easier to wet blend them to bring them together. So those kinds of things I think might help you out some. As far as the damage and the weathering goes, uh, I think it's nice. The one thing that did jump out at me, let's go back to a sort of front and side view here. Um, the scratches are kind of evenly distributed and often about the same size. So there and there and there and there. We want to see different types of scratching and denting. So you got to really force your brain. Your brain wants things symmetrical. It wants to make all these lines the same length. You've got to like have some dots and then big groupings of dots and then a few tiny ones and then a long scratch and then a triple scratch and then a scratch with a big tear and, you know, like little tiny hashes. Like you've got to really force your brain to be random because human brains don't like to be random. So that's the that's just one thing that popped out at me that you may want to think about. Uh, same with if you're going to weather this model up, uh, I would also weather out this, the barbed wire and the, the barricade here. Uh, the reality is this stuff sits outside and it's exposed to the elements. It's not made of stainless steel, and most likely, so there's a very high percentage chance that it's going to weather fast. At the very least, it would be brown and muddy because it's not going to be bright steel. It's literally sitting in a bunch of mud, and uh, like this guy looks beaten to all heck and back. And I would expect this to have much the same feel to it. So there you go. Hope that helps, Brian. Okay, next up, uh, Alan uh, with his Abhorrent Arch Regent. Uh, and his question was about, uh, you know, increasing the contrast on the skin, uh, how to keep it be pale flesh tones and stuff like that. So, yeah, I have a video on painting, you know, pale dead flesh where I touch on the purple type skin. So you'd want to go check that out. But yes, I think you do need to increase the contrast here. And the way we want to do that is we want to introduce some more uh, purple tones and deep magenta tones into something like this. If you go and look at what, like this this figure won overall in the Ever Chosen competition last year. And I would go take a look at that. He His was more of in a green tone, but it'll show you how he divine, def, defines the volumes of the muscle structures in that and the colors he chose and still gets a very dead look and you could do much the same here because i do feel that tonal variation especially in terms of 
value of contrast is our biggest uh, area for improvement. So, you know, glazing and, and volumetric definition of the muscle structures is really, I think, what I would charge you to work on there, Alan. That would be that would be my biggest item. It looks nice overall. I like your color composition. We just need to infuse a little more of that in. So, hope that helps. Okay, next up, Apollo uh, with uh, the uh, with our figure from Miniac here, this wonderful, wonderful uh, Duchess. So uh, basically, he's looking for feedback uh, on the skin and the non-metallic metal and the color choices. So composition-wise, I think it's okay. I would bring a little of this purple up top. That's kind of uh, one of the issues here. You could also have it be this under part of her dress here, and that would space it out rather nicely if this was purple and this was purple like this. I think that would actually help balance the figure rather well. You could also have like a purple streak in her hair or something like that. Uh, you know, why not? She can she can have a colored streak in her hair. Uh, now, as to the uh, non-metallic effect, I think the non-metallic effect here is pretty strong. I like it. I like that the top of your blade is more uh, bright than the lower part. I think that looks fine. Uh, so I think that sells for me. Uh, I'd like to see a little more blue still integrated in the top. If this is the ambient environment which it's not, by the way. You told me the ambient environment is brown, but then didn't put any brown here. But we'll ignore that for the moment. Uh, I, you know, If the ambient environment lighting, environmental lighting is a cold light, then there would still be a little bit of blue on top. So some of that in there would, would help that cell just a little stronger. It's a bit too distinct right now. Like, yes, they're facing in different directions, but they're not so different. Um, as to the skin, yeah, I feel we do need some more soft tones in there. Like where we, when we look at, at her skin, especially in the black and white image, let's, let's go back to that first black and white of her skin. Oops. There we go. She, she looks a bit tired because we've completely circled the eye. Whereas oftentimes female eyes, unless it's makeup, will only come to like out here or right in here at the center. And the most of this will go into a more pink tone. It won't be so dark. The cheeks need to extend color out. Uh, again, my, my best advice for, even for when you have uh, sort of a dead vampire lady here and her skin is going to tend to be a little more pale, is you still want to bring in those pink, those magenta tones and those soft purples in the appropriate areas. Part of what's challenging right now is she doesn't look as, as um, she's looking a bit tired, which she shouldn't. She's meant to look angry uh or fearsome but when you dark circle the whole eye that's what you get the the sense of so softening those tones right underneath the eye and actually making it like a contrast of hue instead of uh, value would really help same with the color in the cheeks and then her lips like her lips not having a color makes her very male so uh like that's i you might not want to put her in full makeup but you know, females we generally associate with having pretty red lips. And vampire females often have extremely, like, blood red lips when they're portrayed in, in art because, you know, blood drinking. So, uh, like, having the lips well-defined and the color in the cheeks, I think, is really what's missing there. So, there you go. Hope that helps, Paula. Okay, next up, uh, Jared bringing me a non-finished piece. Tisk tisk, Jared. I'll allow it this time. No more in the future. Uh, basically looking for feedback on everything. <laughs> this is a heck of a list. Composition, tonal variation, textures, what she do for the sword, uh, and then any or all thoughts. Okay, sure. All right, so um, uh, the I think the skin looks nice. It's bloated. You might want to think about, I like the pink and the and the purple tones in there. You may want to also think about including some um, lighter green tones here and there as well. That could be a nice way to also push it up and make it more interesting. The texture on stuff like the fingernails, I think that sells. I think the rusted stuff needs a little more stippling. It's still, it's moving through the right colors, but it's not splotching quite enough. So a little more of that. Same with maybe a little more of the oxidation mixed in. You've got a little of that, but actually stippling some of that around, I think, would be very helpful. Like, there's little bits here, but stippling some of the edges in it or even some of the raised areas, just things that might oxidize. You can use it either realistically or artistically, as long as it's kind of broken up. Uh, the bone here needs a lot more tonal variation. Same with the bone. All, all of this. 
all the horns, this bone, the horns, they need a lot more. They need to spread a lot more. Like you can see it when you look here. This one's okay. A lot of these are very samey, right? There's just nothing going on here. And we should really feel the striations on this guy as they extend out. Okay. Oop. Uh, on the sword, I mean, I don't, you didn't really give me a photo with it, but I mean, the general answer here is, is it should be a absolutely rusted hunk of rust, right? Uh, which you should just go crazy on with stippling. Include some bright oranges. You can mix in some regular verdigris in there as well, even though it's not traditionally iron. Who cares? It can just be an artistic fun thing. If you watch how Darren Latham, whose videos are still up right now, how he did his, um, his uh, Blight Lord or whatever the heck the guy was, that weapon where he integrated that stuff, I think that's a really good example of how to make a Nurgle-ish weapon. So I'd recommend you check that out. Hope that helps, Jared. Great stuff overall. I think the skin right now is your strong, your strength area, by the way. That variation's good. I like it a lot. Okay, so Jamie, a model for local painting competition, approaching his best paint job, basically looking for a generic feedback that would be useful. Yeah, sure. So I think this is a really nice piece. I like how you used the, uh, oh, whatever this terrain piece is to create like a nice plinth. I actually think that looks really good. The rust and the weathering on the plinth itself, I really like pushing the, a lot of orange tones and stippling in there. That is quite choice. Uh, you may want to get a really sharp, thin line through the lightning. Like, I'll just give you some stuff that, stre that jumps out at me. Some of these sharp, thin lines of the lightning, you need to, like, really get an ink mixed in there and really trace just, like, a really fine line through some of it, I think would be very helpful. Uh, as to the... Uh, the armor itself is good. I feel like we could come to a little more high highlights in some places, like really pop some edges, especially where the light's falling. Here, here, across the top of the knee, on this leg, the bottom here, and the foot. Like just creating like a really nice column of light up that would be good. Uh, the the leather grippy grip of the weapon is rather boring. It's just kind of brown and then the darker parts in between hitting the tops of each of those with some kind of highlight, like actually making the individual elements of that thing stand out, I think is a good way to go. Um, some of the other elements need a little more, a uh, little more action, like the skull could probably use a little more smoothing, that kind of stuff. I think it's mostly just a refinement journey, especially on some of the small pieces. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that's my feedback of the stuff that jumps out to me immediately. The box around the weapon feels a bit flat. So something like adding some more color variation, a color shift, you know, like where it's coming down and getting lighter in value down here at the bottom, the edges of these, the rivets picked out, just making sure you're really hitting all that detail and really trying your best to bring that out, I think is the biggest pieces that jump out at me. So I hope that helps, Jamie. All right, so let's keep going. So next up, we've got uh, Caspian, who brings us his Gotrek. Uh, first real attempt at uh, non-metallic metal and looking for feedback on that. Sure, so let's spin around to where we've got a good shot of that axe. Uh, there we go, that's a nice one. So yeah, I mean, I think that overall, we've definitely got the, the right level of contrast here, Caspian, which I think is great. Uh, I think that you want to add some, infuse some color into that. Right now it feels very black and white, which um, is fine, but you generally want to push it out a little farther. You may want to think about also having like a small secondary highlight. You place the light in the middle, which I think is really good. You might want to also have some other transition where it doesn't go full all the way back up to white, but comes into like a mid-tone gray, maybe something like here and then back out. Generally, if you have a couple variations across the metal, it can feel a little stronger. Beyond that, I think your real goal here is just refinement. So just smoothing out those blends. And like I said earlier, adding in a pop color where you've got uh, some green or some blue or some green or, or maybe even some orange or brown or something in there reflecting from the, um, you know, the ambient light in the, in the universe around him. Uh, and I think that that's going to be a, a really big help. But value wise, you're on the right track. So now it's just refinement. Okay. Uh, next up, Anthony bringing us uh, his big old Nagash, Big Papa Nagash. Uh, he says, this is the best he can do currently. would love some guidance on what he can uh, improve and continue and focus on for the future. Sure. So I'll tell you right now, right away, the thing that's going to jump out to me here is we want to focus more 
on our tonal variation, especially in relation to uh, value contrast. So where it really pops out to me is in stuff like the ghosts uh, or the red of the cloak. I, by the way, the red itself, I'm not really sure you need it or it works, just as a slight note. It's a very saturated red. It doesn't really, it doesn't really jive with this scheme because you already have purple, yellow, green, right? And then the fact that we went to red, it's not really a, a great quadratic scheme. It's also very out of balance. Red is near the bottom only. Like this should be the center of the figure where my eyes are drawn, but it's not going to be because red draws your eyes. It's one of the strongest colors that draws your eyes and it's way down here at the bottom of the thing. So if I just relax my eyes and like stare at nothing in particular, the only thing I see is this and that's not what you want. So variation uh, where I would focus, especially in the ghosts, uh, they need to be way desaturated. Same with the sword. So a lot more uh, uh, value variation there, getting a lot brighter. Uh, same probably with the bone, having a lot more darker parts in that, and then climbing up a lot higher uh, into sort of bright white for that bleached bone. The purple, I think you have the right amount on. It's we're a little zoomed out, but I think that's probably the stronger area. Um, but really on the ghost is where I know it the most. I feel like uh, Nagash would be stronger if his cape just ended in that same desaturated purple that the rest of his armor is. So it wasn't like shiny, but it just kind of came down into a light, uh, you know, violet color. And I think you that would feel a lot more coherent as a piece. I think the red is really extra and isn't helping you any here. So there you go, Anthony. Hope that uh, hope that helps. That's where I that's where I take the piece next. Okay, next up, Chris Howell, uh, the Knight of Justice from Infinity. First real attempt at wet blending on the cloak. Look and some looking for some advice on how he can improve the sword effect. So, uh, well done with the wet blending on the cloak. Now you got to go back and keep pushing it up. So we need to go farther with the cloak. Uh, with the sword, uh, I don't know if we have a real shot that really shows me the sword here, but I mean, the sword doesn't. I don't know what effect you're going for. It doesn't. Like, I assume you're going for, like, a reflective thing where it's, like, some kind of power effect with reflections. But it, it really... We need to go back to formula on this one. So what I mean by that is, like, if you're if you're trying to catch, like, a light reflection coming down the blade, then it's got to be broken up more. I need to expand those volumes a lot. I need it to go, like, a light and then out to middle and then to dark and then to light again. And you can... You can paint it with vertical brush strokes over and over and then glaze and smooth it out so a little bit of that remains and that'll give you um that'll give you a much better sense of actually having that reflection go look at somebody like sergio calvo uh he does that type of effect all the time in his non-metallic and uh and you know kind of try to just look at that i mean he's one of the best painters in the world but uh, look at how he's using his light and varying it across the surface, and that'll give you some ideas for kind of what you should be aiming toward for doing that, okay? Uh, all right, next up, uh, Ewan, uh, leader of his uh, his warrior unit, his Chaos Warriors. I love these new sculpts. A little green stuff work on the mace. And basically, what he wanted to know is some feedback on the flaming weapon and the scheme in general. Sure. So does the scheme in general work? Yes, I think 100% it does. I like it. It's very, like, I like the, the gray blue and then the full blue for the boots. I actually think this is a great color scheme. Uh, does the fire work? Uh, the sculpting works. The fire has way too much Ferrari red in it. We're going we're gonna to hit this again later at some point. Um, like, flame doesn't turn Ferrari red. It doesn't turn red like red. Fire is not this color. Okay, when fire turns red, it's this color. All right, so the key is you, the key is you don't want to be including that red. It should be also less white. You have too much white in there. Like the white should be a tiny, tiny, thin line, if anything. Then go into a, a, a maybe a tiny bit of pure yellow, and then ochre, and then mostly orange, and then into a red, brown, black. And that's kind of the 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 line you want to walk with fire okay i think it works better on the shield because you are uh, much more desaturated in your red on the shield uh because it probably picked up a little bit of the black that was underneath it a little more strongly and uh and and i think it sells a little better there so you also have less white you know there you go 
So more of that kind of orangish color and desaturate your uh, your red into a red, brown, black, like that whole red I showed you. Okay. All right. But overall, great scheme. I love it. I This is, keep going, man. I'd love to see this, this force built out. These new warriors are just, they're fantastic. They're so much fun to paint. Okay. Next up, Zach. Uh, partially desaturated look. Uh, he says, I know his blends and, and glazes need improving. Okay. Uh, just wanting a better table ready quality. So let's review it like that. Let's talk about this from table ready. Okay. So absolutely. Um, yes, I, here's what I will tell you. The main thing I want you to work on is cleaning up your work and your control and, uh, getting your paint applied cleanly. For example, his foot here is not painted. That's still stone, okay? Uh, you know, we have a lot of places where paint is kind of crossing over to where it shouldn't be, and we're still using a lot of dry brushing. I mean, I can tell from the rough texture. So one, if you're going to use dry brushing, that's fine. Buy yourself a set of soft makeup brushes off of Amazon or from the dollar store for a couple bucks. You won't get that effect. Uh, it'll be a lot, and, and wipe a lot of paint off it, like wipe a lot more and rely on more soft strokes from a soft brush and you'll actually get a really smooth effect from the dry brushing. And two, I do want you to work on a little more glazes and control as far as uh, you know, keeping your paint clean and separate and getting rid of that rough, uh, that rough texture where it doesn't belong that's coming from the, the dry brushing. So that's my best advice for you as I think where you could go next, okay? Uh, so I do hope that uh, I do hope that helps, but uh, good luck. Uh, always love to see more more rats in the world. Okay. Uh, next up, Christian. Uh, Hi, Vince. First time fan, long time poster. Thought I'd share one of his all-time favorite pieces. Wondering if any general pointers. Sure. So I've painted this figure, so I know this one really well. I love this little... This is one of my favorite crews in Malifaux. Uh, yeah, so my <clears throat> general advice would be uh, to pick out a little more of the individual detail, and I, like I said, I know how small this is. Uh, but, like, elements of her dress should be different colors, like her bows on a little girl's dress would technically be a different color. You know, elements like that. Uh, bringing out a little more of the texture, like, in frill to the dress along the bottom, I think would be helpful. Uh, but those are all minimal. I like the hair. You could do a couple more thin lines, like really get in there and get some sharp thin lines, but I think it's it's fine. Uh, same with the bows in her hair. These are these are bows, not hair. These should be like pink or something. Uh, and then finally, like her skin is where we've got the most opportunity. Her skin is very flat. It's very just skin colored. Um, you know, if she's, she's, she is a horrible demon monster, uh, you know, obviously who's a, who's taken over the body of a small girl. Uh, all the best things in this crew are like things that seem innocent that are turned into nightmares. That's why I love it. Uh, but like, again, little girl skin should be, you know, pink and, and have these soft pink tones to it, especially around her, the area of her, her hand there as it goes up under the wrist and on the side of her, her arm there and stuff like that. That's where you want to be capturing some of those soft pink glazes. So I think that's probably your your best uh, opportunity. So a little bit more variation in the composition and uh, a little bit more of the uh, hue variation on the skin. Okay, Ma, uh, Ma bringing us his Trample Maw, big old colossal squig proxy that he sculpted, which is super cool. Uh, basically, he's looking for how to get better on painting giant beast skin. Yeah, it's tough, especially with something like this. Uh, so my best advice is, you know, you said you mentioned you just got an airbrush. My answer is come back to me after you're with your airbrush because it's going to completely change how you paint stuff like this. I mean, it's just it's just going to have a huge effect. This guy is really textured, and so it's somewhat different. Like, the, he has a little bit of what I call traditionally forge world skin where it's super heavily textured, so it's a little tougher to say exactly what, you know, you, you should be doing. The answer, because like most model skin isn't like this. It's not so rough. Skin is generally pretty smooth. Uh, and so, you know, when it comes to big giant models like this, uh, I'd say try some more with your airbrush. You've got the right idea. You're trying to vary your, your hues, your colors. Push that a little farther on the values. Like his under part of his body here is basically the same purple as here. You know, this should be darker. This should be lighter. Still think in terms of your volumetric highlights, as always. 
And when it comes to things like his big toe claws, again, think about things like striations and bringing those down. Uh, but you're about to go on a very fun journey, and it's going to make these kinds of big monsters a whole different ball game. So uh, I'll be interested to see your first monster you do post the airbrush, and, and let's talk then, and we'll see what we can do. All right, so let's keep going. All right, next up, we've got Pete, uh, who uh, brings us a big old Archeon. Uh, he said this is the very edge of what he can do, uh, but he says he don't, doesn't think the lit gateway really sells. The OSL didn't quite make it across like he intended. Uh, any critique or aspect is welcome, but especially on the OSL. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, let's take a look here. All, first of all, cool conversion of turning sort of the big beastie into, into everything here uh, with our, you know, that looks pretty nice. Uh, I like the base. I like the integration of the gate. Cool, cool head conversion. So, like, conceptually, this is a really, really neat, unique piece. Now, I mean, as to the glow, yeah, it's pretty weak, but then you've... I think that's actually appropriate because the rest of the piece is lit very strongly. So you have a lot of bright light everywhere else around the piece. It wouldn't make sense that this glow would be that super powerful. So let's actually kind of get up to this one. I think what we need is a little more soft blue glazes of like this color. One of the keys with OSL, remember, is that the the light it casts is not as bright as the light itself. And in the case of something that's blue white, it's going to cast like a soft light blue. So this deeper blue color you have here, like glazing that here and having more of a shadow down here on this side. So it goes like light on the edge. You can have a little white light catch on this very hard corner and then have a little soft blue glaze going down to something very dark, and then, again, blue. And then, again, you'd pull dark onto this side. Like, this side of the pillar should be darker because you can't just make light without making shadows, right? Uh, and then you'd want to cast a little more of that soft blue out onto things like the trees, and it should certainly be reflecting out in this water down here very strongly because that's a mirror surface. Uh, same with everything else. So just a lot more of that soft blue glazing is, I think, where you want to be. Now, beyond that, I think where you want to go is, as per usual, with stuff like skin. Um, I like all your conversions. I think that's nice. I think the wings look really good as far as the the variation goes. I think some of this these elements here could be a little more clean and defined in the individual volumes. So, like, some of the arm muscles and the neck muscles and stuff like that. Kind of shaping those a little more is where you'd probably want to go. But overall, really cool piece. Very, very cool conversion with the, the giant head kit there. All right, uh, Samuel with his Goliath Gang Editions, and he says he's looking at a new skin palette. Uh, yeah, I think these look really nice. They have this wonderful, like, really great sort of, uh, and I don't mean this in a negative way, like cartoon vibe to them. I just mean that to mean they're extremely bright and powerful and potent. I think most of the colors are in great balance, uh, which is what makes it which is what makes it work. So I think that's really nice. Uh, as far as the skin goes, I think it's good. I can see a little bit of the hints of the red in there. I think there's probably some areas where we could have a few deeper shadows, maybe going into almost like a black leather or a purple, where it's adjoining to gear or machinations. So what I mean by that is it'll really come out in sort of this picture. It feels like there's a real dark line here that needs to be smoothed out, but like where it's going into their gloves or their backpack or really hidden, like these parts of the skin that's really, really hidden, I think we could darken a little more. Where there's actual like cybernetics that are, you know, that have an, uh, an, 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 that meet and merge with the skin. I was trying to think of the proper word for it and I couldn't find it. Uh, those kinds of areas, I think, where is where we could see some more bruising, almost that kind of a color, if you think of like a purple bruise. But on the whole, I really like these guys. I think they look great. Lots of uh, attention to individual detail. The bases look wonderful. I think this is pretty fantastic work. And uh, everything sings. Everything's well-defined. The colors and stuff are all sharp. Uh, there's light, nice dark lines between everything. So, yeah, I really like it. Great stuff, Samuel. Beautiful uh, additions to the crew. Okay, next up, Spencer with his... Uh, his uh, looking for color and composition feedback on his converted star priest. Uh, sure. Hey, it's funny. I use this same model for my star priest. That's really, it's hilarious. Um, yeah, I mean, my answer is overall he's so, so let's go back to his comment real quick here. First thought out model tried, uh, tying in the blue from the model into the base. Also the reds and the eyes, feathers and the snake. Okay. So at any rate, when I look at this, this is actually a pretty still monochromatic model. 
Um, I do like how you passed around. This is a good black and white, by the way. It actually does show that you're you're capturing some good shadows that you worked into your metals and on stuff like the bone. Um, shows that we've got some good skin definition on the muscle, but that we could go maybe a little farther. But I think that's a really nice capture. Um, yeah, you know, the sort of purple magenta here of the feathers and these kinds of elements are are well balanced. I don't really see much in the way of, of issue as far as your color balance or your composition goes. I think it all looks pretty great. Um, the feathers have a nice contrast. You can see in the black and white, so I think that looks good. Uh, when it comes to like drawing attention to the head, I'll tell you how what I found, because since I use this same model, let's go back to this initial picture here. By the way, I love all the black and whites. Well done, Spencer. Really makes it nice. What I did is I found it was helpful to just run a bright shadow up here on both sides of the side of the head and really push this up to a near silver and then push some bright shadows here uh, where the crest is going up, like shadow this at the top and then a bright silver line on the top and make this part in the center where it's more of a gentle slope and it has those runes to pop all those out in, in a more of a silver. You could also, by the way, cheat and just make one of these runes red or make some of these triangles red and that would help balance out the eyes and red draws the eye and it would draw more attention up there. Uh, so that's the only thing that really pops out at me. Uh, on the little, his little bone, uh, um, pick scythe thing here, uh, I think you might also want to look at maybe popping that up a little more at its highest highlight. That was the only thing that really stuck out to me is having, like, the top part of it not going quite bright enough if it's meant to be bone. But everything else I think looks really nice, so, uh, well done, Spencer. Okay, next up, uh, Eugen, uh, looking for a focus of critique on the skin and its color, uh, and then the liquid in the bottles. Sure. So let's go over here. Uh, yeah, I think the skin and its color is actually rather nice. Um, we could have a little higher highlight in some pieces of the face where you integrate in a little more, maybe like, um, a sunny skin tone or something for some of these highlights. Uh, by the way, if this is meant to be a true hole in the face, I would actually just deepen it and blacken it out, which I assume it is, because that's a big hole in your skull right there. It's not actually meant to have a back in it. I think that's just a limitation of the sculpt. Uh, so you'd want to fake the hole, basically, a little stronger. Uh, but I think the skin works. It could be smoothed in some places, uh, where we can see kind of hard transition lines, but I think it's actually a really nice, uh, contrast there, because your skin is uh, very... Uh, the blue part's very cold to the warm yellow highlight, and I think that works well with the brown and, and contrasts against that rather rather nicely, rather smartly. So I don't I don't have any issue with any of that. I think that's uh, I think that's pretty great. I thought my main targets for you would be uh, oh yes, let's talk about the liquid in the bottles too. Um, would be just to focus on you know sort of refining and blending. Now the liquid in the bottle, I think that looks fantastic. I think that's a, a highlight of the piece for me, honestly. Uh, I think you're like, you, you nailed it. It's sitting, feels like it's sitting at the angle of gravity. Like obviously it should always be the, the line of the liquid should always be parallel to the ground, right? Because that's what's happening. Uh, and it, it feels like that is. And I love the inclusion of the green and the little touches into the upper part of the bottle to make it feel like that. The yellow has a nice transition with the white at the top and the little bubbles. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you nailed it. I think it looks like a freaking great liquid in a bottle. Like, very, very, very well done. So, I really enjoy that. Okay, next up. Uh, Abel with uh, Horticulus. Uh, no specific events, just looking for, like, uh, you know, or, or feedback. Just looking for, kind of, uh, any way to improve. Sure. So, the number one thing that jumps out to me is something you're gonna, you've heard me say a lot already but it is just more tonal variation, especially uh, contrast uh, of value. Uh, the skin is very samey all the way across. We don't have a lot of definition of the individual elements. Same with the shell, like we can go darker. Some of this area down here under the shell should be darker than say some of these upper areas, like this blue and this blue is the same blue and that doesn't feel like that should be true, right? Same with Horticulus himself, a lot of the colors and elements on him, like having some deeper shadows. You're working in kind of a sickly ochre here. 
So bringing in some brown green tones would be a great way to create and define some of the volumes in his musculature and in the general shapes on him. Uh, on the worm here, maybe some deeper magentas or purples or something like that could, uh, could help you carry a long way there. So those are my initial thoughts for you. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm very sorry, everybody. Uh, next up, James Wilson. Uh, just looking for feedback. Uh, sure. So the number one piece of feedback I have for you, James, when I look at this piece has to do with the the non-metallic gold it's too cold and flat so we're going to talk about our value definition here being one through five as i often do in these videos one being the highest highlight five being the deepest shadow because that's just sort of the easiest way to conceptualize it your non-metallic gold is all three at the highest and then four five we don't have enough two and one here I understand you were probably going for a more cold gold, and I think that's fine. But we're lacking just a lot of the highlights. So you can keep them to a small volume. If you want it to feel more cold, more green gold, that's cool. Shrink your volumes down, but we've got to come up. We're not bright enough on those highlights, and that's probably the number one thing that jumps out at me. The red armor itself looks wonderful. The freehand on the cloak looks wonderful. So, like... I'm well in for all of that, man. You have sold me on all of those pieces. The subtle shading on the white of the gun, I think, looks great. Like, the face looks well-defined. The elements here are sharp. I'm liking everything. Like, especially, by the way, the red. I think the red looks fantastic. It's rich. It's bright. You captured great color and reflectiveness in it. I think it's a, it's a part that really, really sells for me. I think it's just the gold needs a little more brightness to it. And if you don't want to go full on into yellow, we can keep it to a more dim ochre. You could even bring a little blue in just very lightly. Teeny tiniest itty bitty bit of blue. And that'll kind of kill out some of it and make it feel colder. And uh, But that'll still get you that higher highlight. We can still move it up on the value uh, spectrum. So, But overall, it's a great piece. I, I really dig it. This is a very cool zinch. Uh, I don't know what he is aspiring sorcerer guy i guess probably sure why not great color palette okay next up alan uh looking for some feedback to the lava uh and general basing what aspects of painting should i improve on the model while keeping a military style of modeling sure so let's look at the picture he's looking for this sort of dried cracked lava okay no problem so when we look at this and you, you want that kind of lava, the key here is you want to make most of this really dark and then you want to find those spots. What, what makes this interesting visibly? So let's, let's all really look at this together. This is yellow into a sepia into a dark gray. Right? There's actually very little black here. But what makes it seem darker is when we notice the white into the yellow, into the orange, right? And that's what most of this cool color is. So here, we would do the same thing. We want a little bit of like a, a, a yellow-white highlight uh, into a gray and then into this black as you've got it. But then like in these little cracks, in here, in here, in here, it doesn't have to be everywhere. Just like pick some spots like right there. You'd want to you'd wanna make sure you have that white, yellow, orange situation going on, Okay. Now, general techniques for improving, I mean, what we need to do here is start defining our elements, especially when it comes to, if you're looking for a more historical style, that's fine. The elements need to be really well defined, sharpened. Look at, like, panel lining is a thing that comes out of historical modeling. So, like, the elements of the feet all need to have a sharp line of definition. This, uh, the, like, uh, his honorific thing at the front here. This, like... We need those kind of smooth colors. I would. You do still want some kind of panel modulation, like even historical vehicles will 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 use that. They'll just tend to use a fairly quote unquote realistic style of it. Um, but you want to draw a deeper ochre color, like up to the top of the panel or something, because the light's going to naturally catch along the bottom on a shape like that, or on the top of a round shape like that. And then, of course, also you may want to think about things like weathering and streaking, because again. A lot of historical modeling really focuses heavily on streaking, weathering, chipping, 
because these kinds of vehicles, even though they're well upkept, if they're out there for just a small amount of time, it doesn't take much on the battlefield for them to become scratched and worn. Uh, so things like that is probably where I would focus my attention there, Alan. Uh, so I hope that all helps. All right, next up, uh, Jonas, uh, final part of his star collecting for uh, his Skitari, just general feedback. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, we, we've witnessed this over the past couple months, uh, so I think overall you're doing well. Uh, I think that when I look at this, the biggest thing that sort of stands out to me is just, again, some definition of the elements here, like having a dark line in between the, the brass color and the brown itself. By the way, this and this are a little close. I think the the uh, ornamentation here might have benefited from either being a brighter color or even being steel. I know the leg under it is steel, but this is really well separated with a dark line, and that would have helped separate it more from the brown. Um, I would have also, you could have also conversely taken the panel and put another white stripe in there. I think it's really just the detail that, that you know, jumps out at me. So, like, this all kind of blends together. So having like some more freehand or a white stripe here or making this panel white and then fading, that kind of thing would help it really stand out if you wanted to go steel, bronze, you know, white. It would be a lot more eye-catching, okay? And then beyond that, it's just sort of some little items like we want to make sure that the uh, individual elements here are well-defined, like having more dark lines separating the steel and this under here, uh, around the side of, uh, in between like the steel and the orange here, just lots of little type of like almost panel lining type of stuff, uh, is all that really jumps out at me. Maybe even bringing out a few edges, those kinds of things. But on the whole, I think this is really strong. I think it's a nice piece. Like this is a good example here on the back, having a nice dark separation actually between what's the vent and what's the, the brown piece itself. Okay. But on the whole, this is a cool dune crawler. I, I'm glad to see you get it done, and uh, yeah, I dig it a lot. He'll be. Uh, I I just painted this uh, this thing myself not too long ago. Obviously, this this top piece. So very cool work. All right. Okay. Uh, next up, so Patrick, first post, uh, first review post. Just want to get general feedback on the largest model you've painted to date. Sure. This is obviously his big. Uh, Night Titan, Dominus class. Uh, so one thing is try to keep your pictures a consistent color tone. This is very warm. This is very cold. Notice how different those colors look. Like, it's tougher to evaluate when it's like that. Just as a note. Uh, so biggest area where I see for improvement on your night is largely to do with your metallics. Um, the metallics look like basically we just kind of did the old wash trick and stuff like that, I would highly encourage you to go watch uh, some of my videos around how I tackle true metallics when it comes to stuff like this, um, because they look rather flat, and they're, they're really the part that's going to let you down the most here, and where I think you've got the most room for immediate growth. Uh, shading these true metallics more like a non-metallic style, glazing in inks and stuff like that, having brighter areas of silver where we're catching highlights, those kinds of things, I think would go a long way. Minor touches of weathering. You've showed me a lot of battle damage across the hull, and yet the metallics are, like, perfect. So no scratches, no oxidation, no weathering on them. You'd want to be careful about that. You want to be consistent across the piece. If this is getting damaged and streaking, then these should be damaged and weathering and streaking as well. It can be minimal, but it's got to be there, right? So I think those would be my big challenges I'd throw out for you based on the first one. Uh, or based on sort of the, the first blush, I think those would be your, your basic next steps. Uh, I hope that's helpful for you, Patrick. Uh, very cool. Always love to see another big Imperial Knight hit the table. Okay, uh, Corey, first submission. Uh, he says he never really goes out when painting models, mostly for fun, but this was for an online competition. And so he's looking at sort of his, you know, colored non-metallic metal, various textures, uh, and general composition and focus. Sure. So I think it's good. Uh, it's, it's really nice. I like the orange and blue. Obviously, that's a very eye-catching color combination. Uh, I think the axe, for the most part, works. It's got good variation across the like the blade, uh, so I think that works well. Uh, a little bit 
more on the bottom would probably be in order. There's the volumes on the bottom of the blade are a little small and mostly dark. The wood feels like it could use a little more texture, uh, vertical striping and stuff like that. Um, same with where you connect to the hand. Again, always make sure when you've got a weapon connection like this, you're getting those nice dark lines in there. You want a nice dark line separating the hand from that because there, there'd be a space of, of shadow there that would be created. Like, see how my two hands come together? See that dark line in between the two underneath there, underneath my top hand? That's what you what you're capturing by putting a nice dark line in there. Okay. Uh, I like the, the orange texturing on that. I think that works well. Uh, I think the purple, the low shading of the muscle tone with the purple, I think could be expanded just a little bit. We could smooth that and bring it up just a little bit, a little bit more of that into the muscle structure itself. Uh, it feels a bit abrupt right now, but it's good color selection. I like that very much. We just need to play with the volume a little bit. Texture-wise, things on like the cape and the pants, I think those and the belt, I think those all work really well. I think those are very, very successful. So overall, this is a really cool piece. Uh, I dig it. What a great uh, challenge you gave yourself with a cool 3D print. This is exactly what I love to see. People who, you know, painting should be fun. If you're happy with most of your painting most of the time, that's great. And then this gave you a really nice chance to, to sort of stretch your legs and really push yourself. I think that's great. More people should do stuff like that where, you know, every so often they really try to push themselves because I think you did an absolutely fantastic job here. So uh, well done. Okay, Amy, uh, first attempt at a whole model with proper non-metallic metal. Sure. Uh, so, the looking at it here, uh, I think the silver, as it is with all the rust, that's probably where we have the most opportunity because it doesn't really have much variation to it or interest. Uh, that's, that's my biggest challenge. I think most of the rest of the color is fine. It needs to be, you're kind of overexposed on your lighting, by the way, that's coming in. Like, this guy is under direct light, so it's making it a little hard for me to evaluate, just as a word of warning. Um, like, it's tough for me to tell because the colors are kind of blown out because of the, the desaturation. Uh, I think the green looks really nice, and I think the, from what I can see of the sort of gold color, I think it's it's good. Uh, I, I think overall you're in the right direction. It's a little tough because again, like looking at it, I don't, I need a more even lighting. Uh, I feel like maybe we need a little bit of deeper shadows in some of the gold or just smooth them out. So maybe like this brown should be a little more extended, but should be smooth. So it should fade a little more up into this area. Uh, but I think your biggest opportunity is going to be on your steel work, especially like on the weapon and look at how you integrate rust and that kind of stuff into the non-metallic. But for doing the whole fig as your first one with a try, I think this is really strong. I think it's mainly a matter of smoothing, refining, and working on your steel variation, especially as it integrates with weathering. But really cool. Thanks for sharing, Amy. Very awesome fig. Okay, next up, Alberto uh, bringing us the big dragon. Uh, and so he wanted as much contrast as possible. Can't figure out what to do to go to the next level to let the figure pop up more. Sure. Sure. So where we we looking at this guy over like the things like the wings and stuff like that look really nice. In general, I like a lot of the shading and what we've done with the face, but we're going to stay on this this shot for a second because this is where I'm going to where I'm going to take you. So what we don't have is nice deep scale separation nor the volumetric control of the scales. So both the low tone here doesn't go deep enough, nor do the shadows in between the individual scales. And part of that can just be the softness of the sculpt. But like having a really deep section down here where the light at the edge of the scale needs to contrast more against a dark area of the next scale. Like if we flip back here, right? Because that's a black and white of this photo. More, this is where we're lacking darkness. And in here... And in here, like, you've got some nice shading, but a lot of it's happening on the top of this muscle. This should be mostly bright. This should be mostly dark, right? So just a little more shaping of that. And then actually, it's even less the darks, because you do have a nice integration of purples and browns and low tones that I really like. Where you need to really push is actually with the highlights, especially on the edges of the scales. So going back in and actually like taking the side of your brush and just with almost no paint on it, 
and hitting some of the edges of those top scales and these top spaces and really picking out that texture I think would really help a lot in making especially those individual scales and the general volumes of the the musculature itself pop out. So there you go, Alberto. I, I hope that helps for you. Uh, next up, Heath. Uh, first bust he's ever painted. Really wanted unnatural demon skin. Uh, said he thinks the weakest point is the gold non-metallic metal. Sure. So let's take a look. Um, I do agree with your assessment, so you don't need me to tell you that, so that's fine. And, uh, like, the gold does need more work. It needs a lot more value, a lot more stretch from 1 through 5. Now, let's talk about the rule of bust painting. So, the rule of bust painting is more. When you think you're done, you do twice as much, and when we're done with that, you do another 50%. So, like, I see a lot of sections where our paint isn't quite as smooth as we would want it, so refining that really shaping in like around her clavicle and in her neck and drawing some deep colors there but especially in the face busts live and die by the face so a lot more definition of the various elements my best advice for you as always whenever you're wanting to do like female faces and especially busts is you should spend some time on youtube watching makeup contouring videos because those are women who can completely restructure their the shape of their face with color and makeup and powder and they will show you quite authoritatively exactly where colors and tones and shadows and highlights should be placed. Because right now, like, there's not enough distinction between your T section and the rest of it. Right? And so just bringing those things out, introducing, introducing more variation of hue as well as contrast, I think is relevant here. And that's probably where I would tell you to go. So... Uh, really cool bust, and uh, it's it's a great great work for your first uh, for your first ever bust. And now the key is to keep to keep going. So uh, I look forward to seeing more from you and for, uh, more busts from you in the future. There, Keith. All right. All right. So continuing on. All right. So Zen uh, brings us a, a a little Nazgul action. Uh, this is for his next. He's posted last month and got some feedback. And this month he's uh, working on his tonal variation. So sure, uh, basically where can he improve his uh, his his lighting and things like that. So obviously a, a miniature like this is really tough because it's it is very sort of monotone. But where I think you want to improve is what you want to do is focus a more directional light. So as a simple reference, let's just take a look. Again, always the the best answer is to go look at, you know, the real thing, right? And if you look at how the Nazgul are often painted in art or stuff like this, when we look across them, like here, if we look at that image, which is going to be impossible to see because that's how Facebook, or, or not Facebook, sorry, that's how Google works now. There you go. Right, you can see how they've integrated, like, greens and stuff like that into the Witch King to create more color, or how they make light more on one side. You can also see the blues and things like that in there, all right? So the point being is that you want to think more when we try to translate this over. Here you go. This is a nice shot by Moonlight, right? Notice how the light, notice how little of this is actually black and how there's little bits of color, right? So it's the same here. Things like taking the, uh, the, 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 horse's eyes and making them red or hiding a little light in its mouth or pushing the light on one side up there working in subtle greens and blues that kind of stuff can really help to elevate the the paint job okay well i guess that was that's funny i guess that was actually the black and white whoops <laughs> sorry there we go now we have the right one yeah so working the red in the eyes pushing a little more of the light onto that's very funny because it's the Nazgul. I couldn't tell the difference because they are all black and white. So let's look at this color one. What I still said, I like the brown edition of the horse. I think that's good. Uh, but like having the eyes be red, pushing in the other colors into the Nazgul, I think is the right answer. So the tonal variation push here is on hue, not on uh, necessarily value. I think you've got about the right amount of value. We could probably pop the edge of his hood up a little more with like a blue-white light, as you saw in some of the moonlight photos. Uh, so hopefully that gives you some stuff to think about. Sorry about the confusion there. Okay. 
So next up, Damien, uh, he's got his big mega boss on Maw Crusher and looking for some overall feedback, color scheme, etc. Sure. So the first thing I'll say is that, uh, just kind of looking over it, it's uh, very singular in the two pieces. So that is to say, like, none of the... The, the orc is so green and he's right up top and we didn't integrate any of that into the Maw Crush itself. And it wouldn't normally be a problem, but you picked a very, very saturated green skin for the orc. Also, you want to focus on some of these pictures being like more in focus. So when you upload pictures, do try to actually, you know, make sure that they're sharp and focused and stuff like this. This is no good. Get a background, get some diffuse lighting, steady the camera, take the shot, right? Okay. Uh, and so because your orc skin is so very saturated, it makes it feel very separate from the, the mount that it's on. Uh, I think that overall the blue and black work. I, and, you know, obviously you're using sort of an orange color as a, as a, through the copper as a, um, as a contrast. And that works just fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so what I would push you on is really just creating a little more variation around the the model itself. Like I think the black is rather glossy and generally we wouldn't want that to be that shiny and reflective. You know, the blue is rather monotone. Uh, same with his skin. Where I see our major opportunities are really with tonal variation of value. So, you know, like the upper parts here should be brighter than the lower parts here. Like, this blue should not be the same as this blue. This is very exposed to the light. This is very hidden from the light, right? This should be a lighter color than this down here, right? Because this is very upwards and facing the light, and this is very turned in and tucked under. Just that kind of stuff. Same with his skin, especially the face. Uh, like, desaturating the orc. You wouldn't have to, you don't have to work any of the green in if he gets more desaturated through highlights, uh, soft inclusions of reds and pinks and stuff like that, so... That's my big piece of advice that jumps out at you there, or jumps out at me. Hope that helps. All right, next up, uh, Trung, who brings us his uh, his first AOS army, and he was looking for how to paint the pink diamond on top. Uh, sure, again, normally Trung, finished models only and feedback, like not just gen generic painting advice. I have to keep this somewhat under control. But I will answer your question this time, just in the future, try to keep it to finished projects and for feedback. Now, that being said, uh, yeah, I mean, with a gem with a facet like this, uh, the key is you want to create basically just the facet. So it's going to be dark toward wherever the light is. Like, if the light is coming from here, then this would be the dark side, and this would be the light side of this facet, and this would be the dark side, and this would be the light side of this facet. And each one gets done individually. I have a, a video on painting... Um, uh, on painting sort of warp stone and things like that, that you can go check out where I paint those kinds of faceted crystals. And I show you exactly how to run that that sort of transitions. Uh, but it's effectively, you want to treat each facet, each plane of the gem as its own surface, where the dark is towards your light source and the light is away from your light source, whatever that, and that'd be the actual color. Uh, and then you want to have the edges really nicely highlighted because that's where the lights can actually shine and reflect and catch on. So there you go. Hope that helps. Uh, next up, Benjamin, uh, bringing us a diorama for a local painting competition. Uh, he said that, you know, he doesn't know where to go with it from here. So, uh, how can he push this further? Sure. So, uh, it's a, it's a really interesting space. You didn't use too much of it, which is good. Uh, that is to say, like, a lot of people, if they've got multiple figures like this, use a lot bigger space. I think you're using pretty much the right amount of space here. Um, and so I think that works okay for our sort of hospital or healing somebody while the, the other one prays over them. I think probably the biggest issue I have is what's going on with the yellow? Like, I assume that's meant to be glow from something up here. But I, like, is this candlelight? I don't know what this light is i don't know what this yellow is if it's candlelight it's way 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 too bright and i say that because even at nighttime it wouldn't be like this like 
go light a candle in the middle of your living room on a sunny day and tell me how much yellow light it creates. Okay. And that's the basic issue here. You've painted a daytime scene. Like these people are highlighted. The ground is highlighted. This, uh, the, the, the extra face plate here from the night, everything's highlighted as though it were bright, sunny daytime. But then these yellow candles are here and it just looks like a big sort of yellow splotch. I get, I, I really had to cast about to try to figure out what exactly you were aiming at. So like you can have a little candles with some soft glow, but I mean, they should be casting a glow like this. A candle is a really dim light source as it is. A single light bulb is like the equivalent, you know, you're at like a hundred watt light bulb this is like a thousand regular candles, right? So, I mean, just it's, it's that when we're talking and when we're talking about the difference of being outside and assumingly some kind of sun, it's just even, it's even more diminished, right? So, I mean, I think that's the biggest distraction. Like the rest of the, the piece is being hurt by this sort of yellow that's all over it. And even if this were the candle glow, like if you wanted to paint a nighttime scene and have everything else in desaturated dark colors, except for this glow, you could do that, but it would be structured very, very differently. You would still have very little yellow and it would mostly be a soft orange ochre glow, not this cold lemon yellow we've done here. Because again, candlelight, especially in darkness, is a very, very yellow light. And it's way down there on uh, like toward the orange end of the spectrum. So that's my biggest change for you. I know that's kind of a lot of work probably to, to change to fix that around after you put that on there. But it really is the thing that strikes me the most about the piece. Now, beyond that, there's little stuff like, you know, with your dirt, a lot of your dirt is just kind of grayish down here. So again, as always with stone and dirt and the, these pieces back here, working in more colors, more variants uh, of hue into them would be uh, highly recommended. So. Those are the other things that jump out at me. All right, next up, Mark. Uh, first submission, uh, counts as a rogue idol made for his Mountain King general comments. Sure, so we can just continue with what I just said. So I like the conversion, I think that's fine. Uh, but again, mostly what we've got here is some rock with not a lot of other things going on. Finding a gray rock in nature is nearly impossible, like a purely gray rock, uh, because nature happens and so there'd be browns and reds and purples and greens all over here now you worked a little bit of the moss in i can see a little bit of green tone here and there we need to go a lot farther like if this is this thing assumingly is a big giant idol that spends all of its time outdoors getting rained on getting weathered like it's not a it's not a creature that cleans itself so this earth and this rock should be very much grimy and full of like where water has collected and then evaporated and uh, left behind detritus and things of that nature. So uh, I think that that's probably the biggest thing that sticks out to me is that the gray is just kind of too gray and doesn't have enough else going on. Uh, beyond that, I think we could probably push some of the, the tonal variation of value in the skin areas, uh, the sort of brown parts here. That could probably go farther, especially with shadows, some deeper colors and more contrast. So hope that helps. Okay, next up, uh, the uh, Preyton or Perryton or however you say it model. Uh, trying to create an atmospheric swampy base, uh, trying to add more to the swamp. Sure, so uh, many of the same things I just said are going to apply again. Uh, so if you've got this sort of swampy base here, uh, again, like there should be more colors, more plants, more vines. Just, I mean, Google pictures of swamp, right? I mean, that's the answer. Just look at real life, right? Like we don't need to, we don't need to try to cast this in our imagination, right? Everything, uh, like the 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 real world will give us most everything we need in painting, right? We just look, and you can see here. I mean, just look at all these these different colors and things like that that are happening in here. Look at the plants, the leaves. I understand you want it to be a dark swamp, okay? So that looks pretty dark and, and scary, right? And you can see like the stand-up trees, little things poking out, detritus in the water, muck and mire, like all this sorts of stuff, right? So uh, the point being is that you want to have those kinds of elements all diffuse throughout there. And right now we've got some ground coverage, which is good, and, and a leaf, but that's kind of all. So we want to take that and carry it out further. 
with plants and hanging vines and stuff poking up out of the liquid and things like that. So th that would be my biggest piece of advice for continuing the sort of swampy theme. And then you just desaturate that all down with some browns uh, and some very darker green tones and you'll get the feeling of sort of the dark swamp I suspect you want. All right, next up, uh, Connor, who says that, uh, you know, had mentioned that I had said that I hate the Magma Dragon model, and I do. And so he's he's got a uh, Mega Boss on Maw Crusher converted from the Magma Dragon. Uh, so, uh, looking for advice on how to make the wing skin a little more interesting with adding, without adding too much time, uh, as well as do general tips. Sure. So, with the wing skin, uh, I highly recommend you go back and watch one of my early hobby cheatings. I think it was in the 20s, maybe, but it's about textured wings. It's a simple, fast, easy process. You can you can watch there, but it will it will make all the difference. Uh, so you can like it's just dry brushing and, and applications of inks or washes and stuff. It's it's very very simple. Uh, now, as to the color scheme, I think it works. Uh, that is to say, I think that I, I like his Stormcast armor. By the way, I think that's fun. Uh, I think that for the most part, the the red and blue works. I understand you were going for kind of a quicker paint job, and I think this works. It feels uh, dirty and, and sort of grungy, but yet still has some really nice variants to it. The bright blue uh, of that, it's, a, it's this sort of desaturated metallic blue, I think looks really nice on the uh, helmet piece of the Maw Crusher, plus the, the armor. I think that works well together. I think the red sort of freehand and elements up on the uh, up on the orc. I think those work really well. So I think that's a that's a definite victory right there. Um, yeah, I mean I think that would be the main thing with the wings. Probably the only other thing you could do is you could give some of the texture here a little bit of a very light controlled sort of dry brush. And I'm not saying like Ch -ch 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 -ch. I'm meaning more like you just kind of wipe across there a couple times very lightly, very controlled fashion because you want to hit these little horns just to kind of pick out a little more of those as a final highlight, you know, take one step up into a, an orange red or something from, from what this is and, and give that a little touch. And I think you're good to go. But overall, this is a really cool fig. I think you did a great job with it. It's a, it's a, it is the best version of the magma dragon I've ever seen. So there you go. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Nick, uh, first time, a long time pushing his painting beyond tabletop standard. Uh, Okay. Um, looking for help making more realistic natural tones pop more and any additional things. Sure. So, I mean, the, the biggest challenge we have here is, one, it's still satin. You want to probably take that down. Uh, you don't want it, that to be shiny. Uh, shininess is going to very much uh, deter from kind of those tones that you want uh, on the face. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you've got uh, a little more variation of hue in there. So again, there should be a little more rosiness to the cheeks. Watch out for the circles all the way around the eyes. Like I mentioned earlier, it just makes people look tired or high or something like that. You don't, you don't have circles like that all the way around your eyes, right? Notice how the shadow, I'm under an extreme light directly above me. Like I have a, a daylight balanced, uh, more like hundred and something watt bulb directly above me. Okay. And you notice how this part of my eye this part is red, but it's not dark. Okay. So it would be the same here. Uh, and that kind of thing. So the other thing that if you're going to paint realistic, you know, whatever that's defined to mean, I assume you mean like you don't want it to be cartoony and over contrasted. That's fine. Contrast is still very much a thing. And one of the ways you can build that in when you're painting quote unquote realistic is, uh, is through texture. Like this, these clothes, these these this uh, jacket he's wearing can theoretically have some sort of texture to it. So, you know, and it can also be a way to help smooth out some of these blends in here. So you can look at stuff like stippling and things like that to add those texture elements that'll help uh, not only make it feel more realistic, but will also at the same time uh, allow you to build in more contrast in a naturalistic way. So there you go. Hope that helps. Okay, next up, William, uh, first posting with his converted free mil free guild general, looking to work on his non-metallic metal, the free hand on the cloak, and the texture. Okay. Sure. So the first thing that I notice is that it, uh, we want to focus a lot more on cleaning up and separating our elements. So, like, we don't have a lot of hard separations between here. Notice when I, the difference between, one of the simple differences between a good looking paint job 
and a dirty looking paint job, and I don't mean dirty like grimy or gritty, because I understand that's what you said you're going for, is just when I say I mean clean application of paint is a hard separation of the elements, okay? Uh, where I can easily see how everything is divided and the colors go light to dark, light to dark. And that's not happening here because a lot of these things are just kind of running into each other in lots of ways. There's lots of overlapping colors, right? So the first thing I would have you do is focus more on like your paint control and on your paint separation, making sure that we have all the elements in the correct places, okay? Uh, the... Uh, the other thing I'll say is on the non-metallic metal, I'm not sure what part you're going for. Like, I don't know what you're doing with this yellow and color here. I don't know what the yellow is doing here. Uh, it's like, that's not how steel weathers, if that's what you're going for. Um, you mentioned the freehand. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh... Yeah, I just do I have another picture of the free hand on the cloak? Nope, I don't. Okay. That's kind of as good as it gets. Uh I think the like hashing texture on the cloak is fine. I can't really tell with the free hand. It's kind of this isn't the best picture for it. If like if you want me to evaluate something, try to take a picture of it dead on, right? And in clear, diffuse light. This is very heavy direct lighting. I can tell because there's a big shadow right here. Um But I mean it it looks like interesting, so I'll say it's probably fine, but I would need to see it more direct on to, to truly evaluate. Uh, the the thing about the this black and white will really kind of tell us why we don't have enough tonal variation. Everything here is the same color, right? I mean, like when I look at any individual element, even like the chainmail, no part of this is different than any other. The boots, this is all the same color. The armor, this is all the same color, right? There's no tonal variation there whatsoever in that and of, of value. And that's where we run into an issue, right? We want to have that actually have separations from light to dark, and then the individual elements be separated. And that's how we get to uh, that's how we get to something that looks more clean and sort of ready to go. If you're going for weathering and stuff on the chainmail, which I'm, I'm not sure if that's what you were after or not. Oh, there we go. There was a picture of the freehand. Okay, sort of. Now we have the opposite problem. We have too much light. I can't really. I can't really make out the detail, so I'm sorry I can't evaluate that one as much as I as, as much as it, it, it might help. Um, with the the chainmail, my best advice is I don't know what this yellow is doing here, but I wouldn't include any of this. There's like a lot of just sort of yellow that's kind of hanging out on this guy, and I'm not sure why. And uh, I feel that like if you're going for the red and blue scheme, that's cool. Like, to paint dirty, you have to paint clean first and then make it dirty. Because it has to be applied over top. Dirt happens over the base element. And like, painting dirty and making it look good is actually much harder than painting clean. Uh, so what I would what I'd recommend is get rid of that. If you wanna if you wanna have this stuff be rusty or something like that, then what we wanna do is we wanna integrate browns and uh, and oranges and then into like a few spots of bright oranges especially on the edges where the chain links would would very naturally rust uh so that's kind of my thoughts and advice on that one it is a good conversion out of the white king though i like that that different use of it to turn it into a free guild general that's cool cool conversion okay uh jason with uh, his first large scale bust uh and you know he says i know i haven't taken the dark shadows as far as they could go yep that's right uh, and you said partially because you're afraid it would look too forced. It wouldn't. Look at my face right now. Okay? Look at the shadows here. 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 Look at this shadow along the side of my face. Look at the reds here. And here. Look at how bright the light is from the reflection of that light above me here and here. Right? Look at the light on my upper cheek here. Compared to what's here. And the red inside my nose, things like that, right? My head is about the same size as his is on the screen right now, okay? We're about the same size head. And look at the difference in, in color and shadow, right? Now, in addition to that, because you're 
you're trying to make something artistic and eye-catching, you have to push the contrast even sort of farther, even in realism. You know, there are plenty of painters like Sang Yeon Lee that paint very, very, very realistic. Like, if you want to see, you know, like, if you want to see the difference here of where you're, where, where we would go. Okay. So, one of the best bust painters in the world, without a doubt. And, uh, you know, absolutely paints very realistic looking busts. Okay. That was very small. I need one that's bigger. Why are they all so tiny? Okay, but you get you get what I'm saying here. Okay. You're killing me here. Nope, they're just tiny. Okay. So at any rate, you get the idea. Uh I, I, just, I should just get my little picture out of the corner. It's just, it's just constant. Here, we're going to move down here. I'm going to move it in the bottom corner now. There you go. Notice the reds, the shadows, all these things. Look at the different tones that, that are worked in here, right? This is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So, there you go. I suppose if you can't, you know, why, why didn't I just think of moving my, myself first? Because I'm dumb. So, there you go. Okay. So, yes, I would say more shadows... More red tones, more colors like that. That's where you want to be. Uh, I mean, really, if you just, like, you could, uh, just looking at Sang's work as a master class in itself. So that's where I would recommend you go. Okay. Uh, Tomas, uh, feedback on the lava on the base and the fire in the belly and mouth of the monster. Uh, sure. Uh, also, I'm under the impression that green does not reflect red-orange much. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Because it is a complementary color. In fact... Technically, it doesn't reflect it at red at all if it's green. But then, but that's like they, if they're both exact perfect, uh, exactly perfect versions of that color, like a perfect red light against a perfect green surface would reflect zero light. But of course, that's not actually real because that's just not how things actually work in life. Um, yeah, I mean, as far as the, I think the lava on the base, uh, we need more deeper tones in there so like more uh deep oranges and reds and stuff like that uh whole reds like that deep dark red brown black like i'm talking about it's all a bit too yellow it doesn't seem like it has the the variation so go back and watch like my video on uh on painting lava bases and you'll you'll kind of see what i'm talking about there um i think the stuff on the belly and things like that work just fine i i think that part is is okay you don't have like, your glow has maybe a little too much yellow in it. Like, around the eye, that should be orange, not yellow. Uh, but for the most part, I think, like, the stuff on the chest and in the mouth there, yeah, it feels pretty right. I don't have much, I don't have any issue with that. So, yeah, I think you're good. Okay, next up, Richard. Uh, so, this is uh, looking for feedback on the skin tone on Gotrek. Sure. So, we've got some nice uh, variation here. Uh, good volumetric definition of the various muscles. Uh, I think what we want to see is probably a little bit higher highlight up in some spots. Like your shading is really nice. Like we've got our five, we've got our four, and then we just got to three and we stopped. Right. So where we actually need to go is into some higher highlights on the places that would be really exposed. So you've, you've integrated the other tones nicely, but they don't get as bright as they could. And you can see that right here. Right? Like when we go to the value shot, we see the shadows, but all of this is basically the same light. Right? We need to take that up into those those bright highlights where the skin would really reflect sharply. Uh, again, like my skin, way up here, up here, right? These lights, that kind of thing. That's what we want to be catching. Uh, but yeah, that would be my main feedback. Other than that, you've, you've worked in some nice tones here, so I like all that. You could, you could glaze a couple more soft reds in as well, just around some areas where you want to bring a little more hue, not just the shadows, but just some natural hue into the skin. But on the whole, I think it's really the highlights would be your next step. So, hope that helps, Richard. Okay, uh, Michelle, uh, tried a cold color scheme this time to push himself to work faster while achieving a higher standard. Feedback in terms of how he can push this farther in general color choices are much appreciated. Sure. So it's a very weird creature. So it's going to be 
Like, it's a very strange thing. Uh, but the the number one thing that kind of jumps out at me is, again, much like I said before, and like I say, often it's really in the contrast in the tonal variation. That's what I see here. For example, our, uh, like, the, the legs and these arm pieces and stuff like that, we've got kind of this messy dirtiness to it, and I suspect part of that's probably the sculpt because it's a really weird sculpt that doesn't have a lot of actual flat space on it. But when I look at stuff like the arms and things like that, like we, we need to see a little more variation there. Like the top of his belly mouth is about the same color as the lower part of his belly mouth. Or like this side is about the same as here, right? Whereas we should expect there to be some kind of light in maybe the front of the figure or up here or on the top. Like some kind of directionally based light source where I'm able to more easily identify uh, sort of what's going on. Um, you know, same with just kind of keeping some of the colors more cleanly applied. It looks rough. And like I said, I'm not sure if that's partially because of the sculpt, which I'm sure it actually probably is, <coughs> or, or whether it's the paint. But either way, I would look at trying to like smooth some of that out and really like smooth the transitions between some of those elements. So that's what jumps out at me. Hope that helps. Okay, Thomas. Uh, first submission went out of his comfort zone. Uh, so the body has citadels, a grell, and earth, and reds and yellows underneath. Uh, not very happy with the flames. Uh, the base is also, uh, any tips in CC are much appreciated. Sure. So, again, with the lava, see the two or three previous times I've talked about lava in this video. Uh, it needs more orange, and it shouldn't be this color red. Uh, like, this color red isn't actually what lava is very much. It's either a slightly deeper red or it's mostly into orange and white. Like, so you want to create some areas in here of highlight and interest. Uh, I think it's much better executed on the skin. I don't mind that at all. I think that's actually a really interesting take to uh, apply that texture paint over it and then kind of have the cracks seep up and heat. I actually really like that. I think up here on the skin, you capture it really well. Then we didn't execute on the same concept down here, right? So, and... Uh, like I like, you could even have a couple parts where it get, goes up into a brighter orange and then just a tiny spot area of orange, yellow, white. Um, see that again, the earlier images of lava cracks that were in this very video. Uh, but I like the, I like the shading on him in general. Now with the sword, it just doesn't look like fire because we have way too much yellow, very, far too little orange. And then again, we're going into Ferrari red, right? So like if, if this is meant to be fire, then like this much should be white. This much should be yellow this should be orange, and then this back area here should be orange transitioning into a deep red, brown, black, almost what you've got up here. But a lot more of this should be this, uh, and that kind of orange to that transition should be happening there. Okay, And you can dot some orange sparks amongst the flame by just literally stippling some little orange sparks on, and that'll help it make it feel like cracks and little bits of cinders and stuff are flying up in the air. So... Very cool take, though. It's a really neat experimentation. So, cool stuff. All right, Shane. Uh, new to the new to the group and the hobby, but here's your entry. Um, sure. So, I think, Shane, welcome. It's, it's good to have you along. Uh, figures like this are kind of tough to paint because they're kind of cartoony and they don't, you know, it's really difficult to, to, to evaluate them. But I'll, I'll say, Shane, as you're just starting on your hobby journey, my number one piece of advice for you is going to be on things like, one, making sure you understand what colors are going to be shiny we don't generally want our colors to be shiny like your your yellows and your reds are very shiny and you want things to generally be matte that'll feel a lot better um two i want you to work on things like brush control and because you've got a lot of places where the red is up here on the yellow and this isn't quite painted and that's not quite painted and you know just stuff like that the mouth has some red going down so you, i really want you to work on separation of the elements Right, that should be your first step. Just getting that brush control down, being able to cleanly apply the paint where you want it to go and hit the individual elements. That's really going to be your first big challenge, and, and I think that should be your next step on your journey there. But uh, yeah, appreciate you submitting. Okay, next up, uh, Miko. Um, so a bunch of firsts, uh, and uh, he said he doesn't know what to ask for feedback specifically, so anything is appreciated. Uh, struggle a lot with the leather bits. Uh, sure. Um, and then the attempted Maw Tribe symbol on the flag. Yeah, sure. So, 
let's actually start at the end with the uh the maw tribe symbol so i mean it's because you've got yellow and purple and you went for like way too many maw teeth right like yes it's a curved surface but the color you picked doesn't stand out against those base colors at all and then you tried to do a bunch of little ones like six large triangles would have been way easier than the dozen or so you did here and it's still going to sell the maw it's not like you need to have uh you know some exact number like you can just the maw is just a big hungry mouth it can be anything uh, I would also pick a different color. Like, with, with the flag being split between purple and yellow, it doesn't need to be. Um, it should just be all purple, probably. And then you could just use white for the maw or something like that, and it would be a nice contrast. Uh, and when it comes to, like, curved surfaces like that, it's just a matter of, you know, very carefully and slowly tracing it. And that's why if you do big, giant triangles, it's easier because you can start small and then just kind of correct by building out the triangle here and there and then stop once you get it nice and even. Okay. Uh, the rust and weathering and stuff on the hammer and the weapons look good. The um, the separation of elements of the muscle structures is way too liney. Like, we have this single dark line under the pec and this single dark line around the bicep. You're, you're ending in sort of the right color there, but it shouldn't be that dark. Nothing else on this figure says, like, comic book style art, which is almost what that's drawn as. Uh, and you really don't want to have it. So that needs to be softened and blended into the, the skin itself, right? Now, as to the leather, the key with the, the leather and stuff is really just texture. Uh, that is to say, you want to, like, with these little strappy straps, you need to treat each strap individually. So you come in with a little brush, and you line each strap on the edges with something brighter, and then you line each strap in between with a nice dark line and so on and so forth it's a very very laborious annoying process but it's how you make those kind of straps really kick right um yeah so that's going to be my feedback for you for the most part so i hope that helps okay next up uh matt talking about uh with his tabletop gobos and he integrated some feedback from last month uh, yeah, so looking at this one based on the feedback from last month and, and reading it, I think this is really good. Your big, I think the Goblin's good. I like the integration of the red. I think your biggest opportunity now is probably with the metal. So if you don't want to go and add a lot of shading and stuff to the, the metal, then I would add in some weathering. So we can do some, some light washes in some places. Not the whole thing, but some browns or a little bit of agrax or something like that to get that around there. Maybe stipple on a little rust here or there couple little you know rust out the edge of this where there's a connection and that screws rusty or you know whatever because as is right now the metal's very 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 flat uh and we want to try to avoid that even with a tabletop figure but i think with the goblin especially with the skin going for a sort of tabletop standard and understanding that you're going to be painting oh i don't know 100 goblins 150 goblins i think you're in the right place this this seems fully satisfactory to me yeah good job all right, Casper, uh, feedback on OSL. Uh, sure. So let's let's take a look at the OSL. Uh, it's nice because you've got the bright spot right in the middle, which I think is good. And then we uh, we it, it gets weaker as it goes out. Uh, the fingertips I think look nice with the little glow right there. I think that sells. Uh, if there's anything that you could do that would help to push it a little farther. It's you could have some deeper shadows in some of these areas where light would be directly blocked. I think this purple muscle highlight is a little too strong because you need to think about like getting o OSL is one of the hardest things you can paint because you have to factor in how far away is it from the light source? What is the material reflecting it? What color is the actual light and how is it going to interact with the surface itself, right? And what's the angle that the light's going to travel at? And what's, what is the light going to bounce off of and then cause other lights to happen? So, for example, the edge of this gauntlet should probably actually be in blue light. Why? Because you told me the light's coming this way and you told me this thing's metal, which means it's highly reflective. You showed that by putting a bunch of blue light here. If this is reflective, then part of this light's going to come here, bounce, and hit this edge and gather. Okay. So just little stuff like that. That feels a little too saturated. Up here on the glove, maybe, again, tone it down just a bit. It should be like a soft infusion of the color into the base tone itself. So after you apply the blue, sometimes you got to go back with whatever's underneath it and glaze back that color to kind of bring it in harmony. 
So there you go. Hope that helps. Cool stuff, Casper. All right, John uh, with his uh, Karadran Overlord. Uh, sure. So I, I'll tell you right now, I mean, my basic answer to you on this one is really simple. Uh, the purple needs to be smoothed out. You can watch my video on exploring colors purple and you'll see why purple is hard to blend with. And you're, you're like, you're walking right into the hardest way to blend it here. The other thing that I noticed is that the metal is really, really flat, like super duper duper flat. Uh, first off, I would drill them gun barrels. It's, I haven't had to say that in a little while, but drill them gun barrels. Uh, always drill gun barrels. Uh, a, B, D, always be drilling. Uh, because otherwise it just looks... It just, it just looks weird because the end of the thing that he's shooting is just a flat metal surface. Uh, if you don't have a, a pin vise and absolutely can't drill, then at least paint a black circle onto it. So it at least has the illusion that there's, that there's something there. Uh, but on the whole, the metal is way too flat. It's, it's just the metal color applied. That's it. Uh, we need to have a lot more control of shadows in the recesses here, of highlights sketched, of matte colors sketched out, stuff like that. So I think that's my number one piece of feedback for you. I have lots of videos on uh, true metallic and or, you know how to how to uh, add shadow and light to, and contrast to, to metallics, and I would highly recommend you check those out. But overall, I like the base scheme. I think it's really cool. Like blue and the copper works really well together. So you've you've got a solid scheme. We just need to up that that control and that contrast on the metals. All right, Sergey, uh, with his gold smoke knight. Uh, from Kingdom Death Mini. Uh, looking for feedback on the reflective NMM and the flames. Uh, so this is really great. Uh, looking at the NMM, I think this is extremely well executed. Um, I really love the colors, the tones in this. I think they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, the one thing I noted was that this secondary highlight felt a bit too stark, like too flat. It feels like it should have some variance to it in verticality. You varied the other metallics like really, really well, like the other uh, light sources really, really well. This one still feels very like, it feels too single liney basically. Like it needs to have the same transition and kind of change to a point that the the lines, the other lines you have do. Like, this line right here on his on his waist, it varies in size. You know, sort of same here, same here. You know, all these have a nice... You're doing a really nice job of capturing this sort of brushed steel non-metallic. Um, some of them might need a few more glazes, like over here on his arm. That, that Some of these feel a little stark in transition, but it's minimal stuff, you know, down here on his leg. Like, you can spend forever glazing this to perfection, but I, I think you're really capturing it pretty well here. The one that stuck out to me was this, that secondary reflection. Now, as to the flame itself, yeah, you're, I think it's good. Uh, you could have a few spots of a white yellow in a couple places around the helmet itself to show like the hottest, hottest part. Uh, and then maybe we could add, we could push a little more normal orange in there. We do jump from like yellow into red, black, brown pretty fast. Having a little more deep orange in there would probably be helpful. Uh, but overall, this is a really fantastic piece. I think you did a great job with the gold smoke knight here. So this is this is really wonderful. So well done. Okay, next up, uh, Lee Tudor. Uh, general feedback on the model except for the wings. So still working from last month. Uh, what should you focus on to improve the next model and keep improving the unit? Sure. So we'll ignore the wings. Uh, so my feedback for you let me swing around here yeah get closer there we go that's what i wanted uh my feedback for you is largely going to be in refinement so a lot of this is still quite sort of chalky and uh and and really harsh in the blends i think color wise you're mapping it well but we need to smooth it out so the biggest thing that jumped out to me is we need to uh have these be more smooth transitions so some careful applications or glazes of inks or dark transparent colors to sort of like in this area where it's very chalky and here and here and here and here like to kind of bring that all together i think that's your your really your next step that i would i would challenge you on it's not the most exciting process in the world but i think it's really the thing i would focus on if i was you to go ahead and take this up to the next level so i hope that helps lee and keep keep working it keep submitting them i'll keep giving feedback i think they're looking great
I love the conversions you did with these. Uh, so I'm, I'm all about it. All right. Lolol. Uh, Lolol. Denis. LD says, is, has painted this manicure. And uh, does the color composition work? Like, I, I think you got, he was obviously depressed with this one. Like, he felt like he didn't quite hit where he wanted to be. Uh, especially unhappy with the color of the ochre wings and fur. To a lesser extent, the green scales. Uh, sure. Uh, all right. So, and he mentions that it looks too desaturated. So, I don't know that it looks too desaturated. It just doesn't have any tonal variation. I mean, this picture is worth a thousand words right here. Right? You used a lot of quite desaturated colors, and they're all not contrasted. Like, look at the wings. They're all one shade, right? Or look at the heads of the monsters. They're all one shade. Like, this is all the same gray. This is all the same gray. This is all the same gray, right? The black and white tells the whole story. If we go back to the color one, yeah, I mean, what we need here is, I, I think color-wise you're fine, but what we need is more separation. So, like, in the wings, as we get toward the joints and the skin becomes more bunched, it should get darker. Again, go watch the video on um, that I did on uh, on wings. The on uh, God, why can't I think of a name? Not smooth wings. The other one, doesn't matter. On textured wings. There we go. Good night. Uh, go watch that, and that'll probably give you some heads up. Same things for the scales, you know, in here, like, we need more separation of the scales. Now, compositionally, does it work? Sure. Yeah, there's no problem with it. I mean, I don't think it's don't think there's anything wrong with it compositionally. It's a chimera. It's always going to be a bit, uh, you know, kind of split because of the nature of the thing. But what we really need to do is, like, you could take some of this gray and kind of make the edge of the wings, the center of the wings turn gray on the texture, like dry brush some of that. We could have the edges here get more dark. But we just need a lot, lot, lot more contrast overall. That's where we need to go. So... Uh, hope that helps. Okay, William. Uh, feedback on cleaning up details and NMM. Is the contrast enough? Uh, and is the picture okay? Uh, the picture's a little rough because we're kind of far away and it's not super sharp. Um, I can't really evaluate the NMM at the detail level you've given me here. I mean, I can see yellow. So if that's meant to be gold, it's not. There's too much. There's not enough transition in there. Um, and I mean, as far as detail goes or cleanup, it's it's tough to tell. Like I, I need a closer shot with a sharper cut, like a sharper image, in in more desaturated sort of, but but you know, bright but desaturated light conditions. Um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of all I can say. The gold, nothing reads to me here as non-metallic gold, if that's what you were going for. I just see a lot of yellow. So we don't have enough 1 and 2 and 4 and 5 in that, and we're not running the contrast enough, is my guess. Again, kind of hard to see. So I uh, hope that helps, William. All right, Richard. Uh, painting for two years now and getting into airbrushes and glazing over a grayscale pre-shade. If you don't have keen on feedback on color choices. Uh, yeah, I think your color choices are real solid. I actually love these. So the smart move here was putting the red up to the face. As I've said many times, our, our eyes are naturally drawn to the face, and that's, or to, sorry, to red, and we want to draw attention to the face. You've packed a bunch of a cool magenta crimson color in, into the face, which draws my eye right up. Uh, I like the yellow and the green variation into the, uh, sort of green, blue, black, and then into the red. I think those are all really wonderful for very simple figs. I think these are executed on really well. Um, I, you know, you could do things like pick out some of these edges a little more around some of the ghosties just to make some like little light catches on the very edges of the thing. But that's kind of all that really jumps out at me uh, in the initial take. So yeah, I think these Banshees look great. Well done. Composition definitely works. Looks great, Richard. Juan Francisco Gonzalez Hidalgo, the best name in the PMP and a fantastic painter. Uh, and I've been watching this project with uh, great gusto as it's been evolving online, and I'm so happy to get a chance to look at it. Uh, this was obviously recreating the second edition, third edition? I don't remember which one it was. Eldar cover. Uh, it's great. It's a super great cover. I never played Eldar, so you have to excuse me. Like, 
I know the cover off the top of my head. I can picture it crystal clear, and this is such a great representation of it. But I literally could not tell you what, what version or what edition that was. I never liked or played Eldar. Um, but the I think this is really nice. Uh, I really do. I think he did a great job of recreating the, the artwork in general uh, and of executing on the various components of it. Really, the only thing I notice, Juan, and it's, you know, it has to do with what you're doing with the project. The only thing I notice is some more finish on just a few elements where some of the transitions aren't quite as smooth as they could be. For the most part, it's really, really, really solid. I mean, this is a great looking piece and you handle the whites here so well, the blues here so well. There's a couple times where we go into the dark brown where I can still see some pretty hard transitions. Uh, so, you know, smoothing those I think would be helpful. The only other thing that jumps out at me is carrying the shadow lines up a little farther on the non-black pieces of hair. Like, what's strange to me about the piece is your black hairs, you have a shadow line running all the way up. Your red hairs, you sort of do, and on the white, you don't at all. Like, there's a very light blue, and it often doesn't get all the way up to where it should be. So I think maybe more having a slightly universal uh, color where we where those those individual lines are a little more delineated. Not crazy so. I mean, I'm not asking a black line in between each streak. That would look ridiculous and not correct. Um, but in the original art, you know, I think they had some harder, like, pencil lines in there. And so it's just like a soft gray line running all the way up could be really powerful, I think. But overall, this piece is an absolute triumph. Uh, obviously, I despise everything about the Goblin Green base and think it's anathema. Uh, but I understand that it's only a temporary base for a larger diorama, so I am excited to see this Goblin Green go away. But I know you're going for it because it's an early 90s thing, and that was all the rage then. This is an absolute triumph, man. It's a beautiful piece, uh, absolutely gorgeous, and I, I love what you created here. So I think your only other step is maybe a little bit of additional refinement and smoothness and some of where we get down to our darker colors. All right, so continuing on. Next up, we've got Andre who brings us uh, the um, his Glocken. And he says it's the most ambitious pro project he struggled so far. Struggled with painting the horns. Uh, loved your feedback on how the skin and the yellow parts, especially the area, uh, those areas turned out. Sure. So with the skin, the main challenge we have here on this model is it's too samey. I mean, it's you can see most of the comments I've made here previously. Um, if you go back and look at the earlier Creature Caster Nurgle model, it's a great example of how to vary the skin. Now, that was a more flesh tony color, but the same rules would apply here. We want more higher highs, light pale greens and yellow infusions, and then deeper dark greens and purple infusions into the, the wounds and the, the spaces and stuff like that, right? Uh, same with the skin on the actual Brother's Glot up here, those kinds of elements. Now, on the horns, you can get a long way because these horns are so big with just like washes and stuff like that where you're carrying them up and out. Uh, same with like the pustules and boils and things like that. You want to make sure those have some variation to them. They're all just yellow. Um, we need to see like some reds around the side of that to make them really feel like they're they're sort of these bulbous poppy things, right? Uh, so again, more variation of both value and hue is going to serve you well here. So that's what I would, uh, that would be my main feedback for you. But I'm glad you posted. I'm glad you decided to tackle this big boy. Nurgle's a really fun project and uh, this is a great centerpiece. So I uh, hope to see more from you in the future. Okay, Jordy, uh, first review post, looking forward to the advice. Uh, most of his models have followed the, the GW method. Uh, his focus here was glazing and non-metallic metal. Sure. So with the non-metallic, uh, the problem is we're way too stark in our transitions, so we need to smooth that out um, and have a lot more like movement. So like look at what Juan Francisco did or uh, go back and look at the Gold Smoke Knight and you'll see, you know, for a couple of recent ones we just did a couple of minutes ago and you'll see the elements I'm talking about there, right, with the, the transitions. Um, the Now you can have that be... Uh, still in a more like cartoon influence style, but you want to avoid, like if you're going to do that, then it needs to be lots of sort of sharp lines that are very thin and well-structured and, and things like that. Think of how like uh, Flame On paints or something like that with his, his like really extreme color transitions, but they're all like this 
particular like lines that he's cutting and then smoothing the transition between and so on and so forth. Uh, I like the hashing and stuff on the leather. I think that looks really nice. Uh, with the checkerboard pattern, if you're gonna do it, you have to go back and clean it up. Don't just paint the checkers once and then stop. You've gotta go back with like your white and make sure that everything's nice and even and squared off there. Uh, part of the key to good freehand isn't just painting the freehand, it's then painting over top of the freehand and covering over the mistakes. Uh, and those would be sort of the main things I noticed here. Uh, the red looks really nice, nice soft glazes. I've got no issue with that. Uh, I think we could probably do the same with some of the orc skin and glaze some more colors and tonal variation into that as well. But there you go. Hope that uh, hope that all helps. Okay. Uh, Brendan, uh, first time posting something for the end of month review. Uh, this is for a local painting challenge with a theme of violence. Uh, trying to focus on improving his painting really and would like some feedback overall. Sure. So my answer is going to be, again, this is a nice shot to show it. Um, this is going to be much the same as what I've said many times throughout this review, which is we need more tonal variation in general. So for things like the bone on his helmet up here, like, and the red, like we need more highlight, more shadow. We're way too in just a three here. We have a lot of mid-tones and not much else. So on the metal of the chain mail, we need to use like some black ink glazes and some brighter silvers to create transition there. Uh, same with the, the red, we need brighter reds and then going down into deeper shadows. You can watch my Exploring Colors Red video. I talk about lots of ways to manage red. Uh, same with things like the brick here. A lot of these bricks look very soft. Um, so if you're going to do this sort of thing, which is fine, uh, just make sure they have texture like bricks. Like texture will make things look rough. So, you know, stippling and stuff like that on there. <clears throat> same with the, the Dead Space Marine here. Uh, so stuff like that would be my, my main challenge to you where I would push you to go. Uh, just a lot more contrast overall and really pushing those highlights and shadows. Very cool though. I hope you did well in the competition or if you didn't enter it yet, best of luck. Okay, next up we've got Jeffrey. Uh, he said he got some feedback. He was aiming for strong contrast and the saturation between the armor and the rest of the model. Uh, clean paint job that delineated each element of the model. Okay. Uh, what strengths and weaknesses do you see? What's the first thing that jumps out as room for improvement? Sure. So I think you did very much accomplish. This is a good example of the keeping the, the elements separated. So we've got some good uh, light to dark transitions. I think we could go even farther with some of the leathers, like especially up here on the arm and stuff, like having a slightly darker separation between the elements. Uh, popping up even a little more of the light on the top of the thing. So we could have go a little darker here and a little lighter here. Uh, same with maybe a little bit of, a little bit more hashing and light on the leather there. Um, overall, I think this is a, a, a nice piece. I think it's really good. I think deepening some of the shadows on the leather is going to be something you'd want to do, like glazing in some darker brown, purple, black tones, I think would make that really sell. Uh, the only other thing that really jumps out at me is the gun. The gun feels a little flat. Like there's not quite enough, um, there's not quite enough highlight to it. And it almost feels like it should carry out like, like you saw with the gold smoke knight where it's the brush where you have kind of the, the stripes going, they would be horizontal on this miniature because they're, you're, of the way the light is. Uh, it's, even if it was just on like the, the silencer, I think that would feel really good because that would tend to be a machined metal piece. Um, I think that could do a lot of work. But overall, I think this is really strong. Uh, I like the green. I like those elements, how they stand out. I, th I think you've, got, you've captured some good texture here. So I think that's really good. Yeah, well done. Okay, next up, uh, Sang. Uh, <laughs> hello again, Sang. Uh, second attempt at white non-metallic metal. Uh, sure, so let's take a look at this. So I think, Sang, we've, we, I like the integration of the other colors. You've brought sort of a soft turquoise or a teal into this which I think is really nice. Uh, but we've lost the thread here almost a little bit because we've gone a bit too far and now we don't have enough white. So the rule always when you're doing a non-metallic of a color is that 50% of the surface has to be that color. That's a guideline. It's a simple rule of thumb. It's not always true, but it's true enough to live by. And a little bit less than that has ended up white. So, and it's not far off. Some areas look better than others. Like his helmet still looks quite white because most of that, because we're still following that ratio there. But on stuff like his arm or his legs, especially, we're a little too much in the shadow. I really like the color. We just need to increase the volume of the white slightly, keep the rest of those transitions, 
and I think you're getting to a good place. You also may want to think about moving it so they, it goes back to white. So for example, you can have it be white up here, or go through this green into a darker, and then have like a lower white here, okay? Like starting to transition back into a gray white down here. And that can be the secondary reflections of bounce lights and stuff like that. Same with the knee pads, where you commonly see this all the time is on Space Marine knee pads. They're the perfect thing to practice on because they're almost a perfect globe. And a globe always has a bounce light. Like if this is the globe, you have the brightest part up here going down into shadow, but then you've got a bounce light down here that comes up and hits it as the light bounces off the ground and hits what's underneath it. So a little bit more brighter white, gray kind of down here would be another way to turn the volume back, tilting it toward the white spectrum. But uh, really cool experimentation. I, I like the addition of the other color. It could probably be desaturated even a little more. Like, this is a game of inches, and it's, it's constant adjustments to get it exactly where it should be. So I think probably just a little bit more white in there, and you're good to go. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Lauren, who said this is the result of some deliberate practice. Uh, feedback on the elements he tried to focus on, the gold non-metallic metal and the shiny armor. Uh, sure. So with the, uh, this is a riot of a piece, so it's, it's a bit hard, but, uh, with the gold non-metallic metal, we're missing our two, uh, a little two and a little three. What I mean by that is we have our deep shadows and we go to our high highlight, but then there's no mid-tone in between. So I need more ochre stretching out over this area to kind of smooth the difference in between the brown and the white. We don't have enough of the ochre tone to make it actually feel like gold. Now, as to the shiny armor components, um, yeah, I mean, I feel that's fine. Obviously, with this kind of turquoise, we could use with a little more smoothing and cleanliness of our blends, but I think the lighting there feels pretty appropriate. You may want to look at, if you're trying to do shiny armor, putting on some final light dots. Uh, recently... Um, uh, uh, Angel Geraldez, uh, did a really nice video where he was doing a Stormcast Eternal in a really interesting color scheme of non-metallic. And one of his final steps was sort of placing these final light dots that really kicked it up and caught the reflection because it's meant to be that, like, that light point, you know, where, where you can see as I move my ring around how there's that little piece of light, like, right there. Right? That's what you're trying to catch with that little light reflection. right? So something like that can go a long way. So there you go. Hope that helps. But very cool stuff. And I love the deliberate practice. Keep at it, Lauren. I, I, I love it. Okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, after a year from painting, picked it up again and painting his first Space Marines. These will be for a kill team. So he's getting a little more tryhard. What should he focus on? Kill team's so wonderful because it's exactly the chance to do stuff like that. So uh, what I would focus on here is much the same thing I've been talking about a lot. So uh, focus on kind of the, uh, a little more tonal variation and popping up some of the elements, but I'd also focus on separation. The biggest challenge we have here is on separation of elements, just like there's no dark lines separating the individual pieces and that's making it kind of all run together. What we'd want to see is like a nice dark deep line around the belt around here, like panel lining around the knee in this spot, under here, over here, or between the boot. Like, in general, Space Marines are a really good chance to practice with panel lining. There's lots of ways to do it. They, there's special enamels for it. You can just use a ink with some flow aid. You can, you know, paint a deep, uh, thin black uh, paint in there. All the ways in the world, but it needs to be there. And then, conversely, we want to catch some of the edges. Now, we don't have to go full-on GW, edge highlight, everything, top, bottom, left, right, and, and in between. But, you know, some of the edges that are more turned toward the light, like this front edge of his, uh, of his chest piece around his neck, and here around the top of the knee, and, like, the bottom here. Like, those parts that would naturally, the, the edge of his, like, pointing hand here, where the light would naturally gather along a hard edge... That's a great place to, again, pop that contrast, and it'll look really good when put against the dark line of, you know, separating the knee element and the hand element, the finger element from the, the uh, back of the hand element, and so on and so forth, right? So though that would be my main uh, challenge for you going forward as you continue to build out your kill team, but awesome. Uh, building kill teams is such a great, fun excuse to, to, <laughs> to just do, like, you know, eight guys. It's great. Okay. 
Chris Lang. Uh, Chris, small diorama he created for the Grim Dark paint contest. Know if the lighting and composition works. Uh, sure. So we're actually going to flip around to this one. Uh, so first off with the lighting, uh, this doesn't work because light doesn't end like that unless there's a physical thing actually stopping it. Like I have a couple lights up on my wall right now I'm looking at and like that light is shining out and it just goes and it gets diffused. Now there are some cast shadows. So the cast shadow thing works here. I actually quite like that. These should actually be a little darker in the middle, like this piece over the top. Unless this is also a light, which I don't think it is. You've told me it's not with this cross. You've told me that what this is is like a um, like a metal grate over the light. So that should still be dark in the middle. It shouldn't be bright. Okay. Uh, now, at the same time, what we'd want to do is make sure that the cast light on these guys is largely focused from this light if this is the light source in the room. So that is to say, like, they should be much more lit on this side and much darker on this side, right? This area of the peck, this area of the peck, this area of the head, this all be very bright, and this area being very cast in shadow. So you want to really push that extreme contrast if you're going for that kind of a, a, a yellow lighting source, okay? Uh, compositionally, for the actual, like, base and the piece, I think it works just fine. I think it's a, a nice, cool conversion out of, I think that's the, uh, the servo hauler, from the Adeptus Mechanicus set combined with some other Adeptus Mechanicus pieces. So I think that all works. I think that the scene itself actually looks really nice and grimy and gritty. And I, I like a lot of those elements. So I think that's all rock and rolling. Uh, the rust and the weathering look really good. Uh, I just think that ultimately we need, um, yeah, we need to basically more directionally control the light. And this should basically be a soft diffuse light over this whole wall. Being brightest about here, you're correct to do that because the edge of this would dim this part here, and then it would be brightest about here and then just fade. Like I'm literally looking at a light on my wall in almost that same, not exactly the same shape, but of the same about tone, and that's exactly what's happening. It's just kind of, you know, going and fading out. So there you go, hope that helps. Okay, next up, uh, Robin continuing with his, um, with his work on the uh, Corvus Cabal. Uh, says he struggled primarily with the ruffs and the feathers. Uh, the latest one pictured solo as the last image. Uh, tried a different approach. The ruffs is struggling to have a different colored feathers in such a small area look good. General tips for how to improve on overall quality and more tonal variation into the turquoise feathers, specifically pouring tons of time into them and failing. Sure. So let's take a look. Let's go to the last photo. Here we go. So we can look at this guy. So with the turquoise feather, the key is actually pretty simple. What you want to add in is you take the turquoise and you want to add a deep blue black. This can be something like a real dark blue. It can be a Payne's gray. It can be anything like that. And you want to get it real thin and just glaze it in there on the feathers to bring it down. That's generally going to be your most realistic shadow with a turquoise color, you know, sort of not caring about anything else. You can use, you can use a lot of things to, to shadow everything, but that's a good all-purpose kind of solution, okay? Uh, beyond that, I mean, I think he looks fine. I think this transition is a little harsh. Uh, so I'd watch that. Like, I don't know where the pink is here. Make sure we've got a nice dark line separating these elements. And make sure that on our metals, we're doing the work to also put in the contrast there. So that's, uh, that's really my best advice. But on the whole, I think you're doing a good job with these guys. Um, the... Feathers need more like more of that drawn in glazed shadows. Use something like that Payne's Gray to draw the rough and the feathers down uh, and, the, and the light down. And then use a little like an ivory or something and really get in there and make some super thin hashes with a sharp brush that's really flowing. You know, mix an ink in or some flow improver and give us some real nice hashes on the top. And that'll create a lot more value contrast on that. I think you could also push the pants a little bit farther, especially in the shadows. Uh... The highlight might be high enough. We could maybe go a tiny tad bit higher, but we could definitely go lower. And again, all, we could use the same color on the turquoise here, the, that sort of Payne's gray, that blue-black. Use that same thing on the pants to deepen those shadows and, and bring them down a little as well. So there you go. I hope that helps. But these guys are a really fun ride of colors. I think it's great. You are doing a great job of balancing everything uh, across the model, so that would be my recommendation. All right, next up, uh, Pete, who's working on pushing his true metallic metal. Uh, sure. 
So I love a good uh, shading of true metallic metal. Let's get around. There we go. One at the front shot. Uh, I think we're doing well here. We need to... Uh, you've got some good variation, good work of the purple. Now we just need to bring up more of the highlight and more of the bright color. So especially on like the chest plate, having a line go down here, having this edge be catching, having a light like here that would be catching. So just kind of controlling where the light is in your light placement, you know, on his foot. This should be a very bright silver spot down here going into bright gold and then the shade falling down here somewhere. One of the advantages to trying this on Stormcast is there's a thousand non-metallic metal Stormcast on the internet, a search away. So if you go to that and kind of look at where the with non-metallic metal they've placed their light in their shadows, uh, it's a good guide for you to use with your true metallics as well. So there you go. Hope that helps. Really cool fig. Okay, next up. Uh, Sam uh, bringing us his latest on his hobby journey. Uh, says he wants to eventually get toward uh, display quality. Uh, and he, he mentioned he caught a couple non-smooth blends. Cool. Good stuff. Uh, taking photos of your models and then looking over them, you'll be surprised how much you notice that you didn't notice before. That you're just missing when you're looking at the thing in person. Then you look at a photo and it just you, you catch things. Uh, so, uh, where we I think we want to go here is again in variation of hue. So things like when you've got things like the the little uh, dots or bumps on him or whatever, you know, make those a different color. Fortunately, this cave squig has got a lot of good examples out there. So Andy Wardle's recently working on one. Richard Gray had uh, did one that was really, really awesome. There's just lots of painters out there who've, who've tackled this model and done a great job with it. So my advice is go look at them and notice how they use colors and how they work things in and texture. Because I think where I would push you on is you're working hard on your tonal variation of value. Now we need to work on hue. Uh, so like adding in more different tones. When it comes to the bone toes and stuff, again, that's more chance where we need to get a little more actual value contrast there. Same with the blue armor. It's all a little too blue and not enough kind of white or whatever we're going there for the reflection to pop that up. So those would be my challenges for you for the next time. But I think you're... You got a nice piece here. It's really cool. Uh, I do like how much you are you are drawn to sort of the face of the thing because this line of white blue. I think that's a good compositional choice. Uh, so, well done. Yeah, the Loon Boss on Cave Swig is just a really fun model. Okay, next up. Uh, we've got Jim, who's... Uh, uh, I challenged him to work on reds because they were flat. So with this project, he's trying to do just that. A lot of back and forth going on here. Uh feedback in this area would be very appreciated yeah sure so we're definitely getting there that's what i'll say um when i'm looking at this i'm liking a lot of what i'm seeing that shoulder's looking good that backpack's looking really good yeah this is looking a lot better and you can see it in piece in, in like this black and white where the knee here on the front is just a really good example of it how how nice and deep that shadow is how the light comes up Really nice, really reflective. I like that a lot. Um, I think we need to work on the chest piece a little. That still feels a little flat. Just carrying kind of those concepts out like you executed on here throughout this thing. And like on the chest piece, if it's flat and the light's from above, then the dark will gather toward the top. Or we can create a light line or something like that. You know, you can, you can kind of make the light be however you want. What you kind of told me from this knee is that the light is coming in like this, right? At this sort of uh, 2 p.m. angle. So then ostensibly what should happen is this would be really bright, this area here and this area here would be bright, and my shadows would be gathering up here and really dark, and then I'd have a really nice bright edge. So just stuff like that. You're definitely making great progress. Keep pushing it, and uh, I think you're going to make some... You're, you're, you're really doing a great job here of, of boosting this up. Okay, next up. Uh, James, new to the hobby. Uh, you know you didn't miss the cutoff. Any tips can be improved. Sure. So, uh, James, looking over the model, uh, I think it looks really nice. I mean, obviously, who doesn't love uh, the uh, Saurus Old Blood or whichever one this is? Scarred Vet? I don't remember which one has the shield and which one has which. Uh, on Carnosaur. Uh, I think this looks nice. I think you've got a good color scheme going here. Uh, your pictures are... I, I would have loved like a front-up angle a little close to this guy. It's kind of hard to tell. and Our lighting's not great. 
But where I'll say we've got room to improve is in things like the shield and in making sure the individual scales and elements there are well-defined, much like you did down here on a lot of the beastie. We didn't define as well up here. The other thing I would encourage you to do is push yourself on your metals. Um, your metals are very flat. They're just kind of the metal paint applied. I have a lot of videos on how to make true metallic metal pop like non-metallic metal. We need more colors, more tonal variation in that metal. And, uh, and that's really going to be your next step that's going to make a big difference for you there. Uh, but welcome. Very good stuff overall. And I, I hope to see some more Seraphon from you in the future. I think they're su looking super cool. Okay, next up, uh, Jacob. Uh, this is, a te a, in a sense, a test piece for his skin on his Abhorrent Arch Regent. Uh, looking for feedback on the skin as well as any tips to the eyes. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, eyes are tough in this scale. They really are. Uh, you know, it's, I think your eyes are probably about as good as this model could get because it feels like he has real tiny eyes. You can try to push them out a little, get a really sharp brush with some well-flowing paint, some magnifiers, and go in there and give them a pupil. But with Undead like this, I think a single glowing eye is fine. Now, as to the variation on the skin, uh, I like the reds. We need to smooth it out some. A lot of it's still a little rough in its application. Um, I like the the uh, inclusion of the sort of reds and stuff like that. I think that's fine. Uh, but I think we need to, to basically just smooth that out. You may want to also think about how you can get some sort of purple tones in there to softly transition. Uh, a very like faded purple down in this area or in the deep shadows as opposed to that dark gray. I think that would feel a lot more organic and it would end up making it feel still very dead but still more like a living thing as opposed to he almost feels dusty right now. So that's kind of what jumps out to me, Jacob. Uh, I hope that helps and uh, can't wait to see how the Arch Regent turns out. Okay, next up, Jake, uh, some non-metallic metal. First reel goes at it and jumping in into an all non-metallic army. Oof, bold move, bold move, Cotton. Let's see how this works out for him. Uh, feedback on what works, what doesn't, and what can be improved. Sure. So, uh, I think it's looking nice. Uh, you definitely are running the full contrast, which I like. I see everything from one to five there. Uh, as I mentioned last time, we need to smooth a little more mid-tone. So we have a little too much five, a little too much of the darkest color. Here, here, here. We need to bring that more into a four, three zone. Uh, I think is probably our best bet. Uh, but you can definitely like, boy, the black and white on this tells the full story, right? When we're talking about contrast, like, look at that beautiful contrast on that non-metallic metal. Yeah, that's that's what we want to see, right? So I think here on the back, it's a little bit uh, better because, again, like what you did here with the more minimal amount of brown and then going through, uh, we need a little tiny more white down here or ivory or, you know, a close approximation. And then I also want you to look into light catches. Uh, so uh, Darren Latham on his blog uh, on Raza Mini Painting, he has a great... Uh, article about painting non-metallic gold if you just literally search for like uh darren latham non-metallic metal blog you'll it'll be the first result that pops up and if you read that article it'll show you all about like the light catches and stuff like that <clears throat> those can really make it pop uh the the only other thing i would say is work on your smoothing uh one of the things you can do on your steel like i noticed it most on the steel but a little on some of the gold it looks a little rough the transition you can smooth that with an interference color. So for steel, it's generally blue. For um, gold, it's usually like some kind of a sienna or a color like that, where you want to use that to kind of glaze over and really smooth down those transitions to make sure they're nice and clean. But uh, yeah, those are my thoughts. Uh, really cool stuff. And uh, I'm loving the, the it's, it's super bold. Uh, here's hoping Nova happens. And I hope to wander by a table and, and see this army on it. I hope to see you there, sir. All right, next up, uh, Bill, old Bleep Bloop, bringing us his finished Night of Shrouds. Uh, curious if the writer and Steed look too similar. Uh, let's take a look. So, obviously, I love any month where we get uh, a Bleep Bloop submission. And, you know, the answer is I think they are uh, similar in composition. So, it's interesting. It's a really interesting challenge. From the back, I think the answer is clearly no, because I have so much more of this cloak showing, the dark cloak, that it's not as, as bothersome. From the front, it's a little bit more it's a little bit more difficult to see because there's less of that 
sort of dark color exposed. And I wonder if maybe the answer uh, wouldn't have been to, like I'm trying to think of the answer to still keep you coherent with the rest of your army. It's a really interesting challenge. Like this one presents a problem because so much of what you see is actually green. And by the way, I don't know if that's actually a problem uh, because in the end, maybe who cares, right? Uh, that they are both ghostly stuff. So, okay. Um, but if you were going to go that direction, one of the things I think you could do is really pop the highlights up here on the horse. It's probably not not lighting correct but really who cares like it's it's a ghost horse it can be lit up wherever it wants i'm thinking if this was really bright up here like if we reverse to create to add in basically like uh, so if we had if we were going like super light dark super light dark light dark light then we could sort of alternate it in a more organic fashion i think where we're actually running into the challenge isn't the color being similar i think it's the value being similar right so that's probably my thought. Like this, take with the sort of lighting you did here on this part of the horse's like collarbone or whatever and extend it out all the way. Uh, and I think that could probably help a lot. Just a thought. Uh, but I think he looks great as always. So super cool as usual. Always a great month when we see a bleep bloop piece. Okay, next up, Robin. Uh, Almost said done besides the base. If you clean up, it's mostly looking for advice on pushing the contrast and where to kind of take it to the next level. Sure. Uh, so, oh, there's one more thing I want to say here or that he, he mentioned. First time working in striations and texture on the carapace and wing membrane. Yes. So let's talk about striations. Um, we need them to be a little thinner and more. So get your paint really flowing. Get yourself some flow improver and really work those striations. Right, that's that's the the biggest thing I noticed is that they're a little too thick and chonky for what we want there. Now, as to the contrast on his skin, I think that's fine. Uh, I'm going to assume you're not done with the claw yet because that looks pretty flat and everything else has a lot of contrast. Uh, I think the skin looks great. It's got a huge amount of contrast. I think it looks really nice. I think the striations need to be thinner and closer. And then I think the wings need a little more action, especially in the middle, a little more tonal variation on them. Those are the elements that pop out to me for where your sort of next steps are. But overall, I think it's a really cool mini. So yeah, I think you know, I'd like, I've never seen this particular color scheme for Tyranids before. And I actually think it's really fantastic. I, I like it. So very cool stuff. All right, next up, uh, Kyle, uh, his submission. Uh, first in a few years, uh, his Thanesh Chaos Chosen Blood Bowl team. Uh, main areas you'd like feedback on is how to work with pale purples better. They are a pain to blend, that's true. And how to improve his non-metallic metal. Sure. So, uh, with the non-metallic, we don't have any real big areas of it on this guy, honestly. It's, it's pretty small. Uh, so... You know, as and as we look through the team, we'll just kind of my comments will be pretty similar across all of them. Um, the but again, if we're, we're for the non-metallic, we need to have a little bit more of like the edges highlighted and caught the, and a little bit more of the uh, the sort of white represented into the the lower shades. It's hard because they're all really small areas. And so, like, this, as just a simple example, the, the Chaos Star on, on their belt should be, like, popping out a little bit more into the white. Should have a secondary reflection on the bottom, like I mentioned before with the globes. It'll go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, four, three around a globe, right? Uh, now, as far as working with the pale colors, yeah, I mean, it looks a little rough. Uh, the answer is you want to find a nice creamy light color like that. Some brands are better than others. Uh, scale pro acryl and the new like um uh ak interactive third gen i think i'll make really creamy versions of that stuff uh chimera colors can also be used to mix it really nicely but effectively you want to work more strongly with the bright colors and then just rely on glazes of your dark colors to bring it down and that's how you'll get a nice smooth response so think like you're applying the pink or the the magenta or the fuchsia in a nice strong way and then taking the dark purple and just using that as because that's very naturally transparent and glazing that down okay so that's my best advice for you there overall really cool team i mean what a, what a super awesome blood bowl team i had no idea this sort of thing existed so it's pretty cool 
Okay, Mark Tan uh, says, really tried to push the contrast on this one in his first stab at OSL. Uh, okay. Um, sure. Uh, the OSL is crude, and I realize it needs to be on more of the road, but any more tips on how to improve it are much appreciated. Yep. So let's talk about the... Um, I think the face looks good. Uh, as to the OSL, it probably shouldn't. Again... Like, the trick with OSL is OSL needs to be either an overwhelmingly bright source or the only light source in the thing. I don't think the sigil is competing for much attention here. The face itself is uh, is quite bright and quite attention-getting, and I think that, that works. It's also framed by the red, and red is a very attention-drawing color, as previously stated. Now, as if you want to make the rune glow, what we actually need is for the rune to just glow. It needs to be brighter. It's not bright enough. It's sort of this mid-tone green, and that's it. That's where it stops. We need the rune itself to go up into a very, like, white-green, bright color, especially here in the middle, and then to kind of fade toward the outer edge. So actually sell the effect of it being super bright and then getting uh, less bright and then casting a little bit of its uh, glow around. Green light will not tend to show on red. And then again, you've got to think about not only distance but material. Right? So, like, none of these materials are very... This this glove is not very reflective, so it should have a very soft green on it. And if this were a lot brighter, it would actually work a lot better. The metal of his shoulder pad is quite bright, and so there'd be a real distinct... Or is quite reflective, so there'd be a real distinct bright green line here. But, like, if we... It, but if it's going to catch on his face, then it would be hitting all of this. Right? Like, once you stretch out a line of the light... You need to move that around. Almost picture like a string being drawn from your light source and may and draw it around just like if you were measuring on a piece of wood, right, to try to make a circle. And all everything in there needs to be touched by the light. But how much of it is going to be dependent on the surface, how reflective it is, the texture it is, the color it is, right? Like, again, this is why OSL is a really complex thing to do, all right? So, uh, but my best advice would be pop that rune way up and then that's going to really help sell the overall effect. So there you go, Mark. I uh, hope that helps. Okay. Uh, Tebow, uh, bringing us a, a great shot with his new camera. Uh, says you want to try a more illustrative style, illustrative, and uh, add cast shadows on this one in the end. I don't know if it was strong enough uh, or if the OSL coming from the side prevented it. Uh, yeah, so let's take a look. I think this is a really, 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 really great piece, by the way, uh, Tebow, just right out of the gate. I just want to say I'm off the rip. I, I like your interpretation of this. Uh, I think the skin looks really good. Uh, I think the cast shadows work. I don't think that's a problem at all, actually. I think you've quite accurately captured the dramatic lighting. It could probably be smoothed a little bit. Some of our transitions, especially on the shadow side of the face with the cast light, are a bit harsh like especially here on his temple and here on his cheek it feels like it's kind of dying a little faster than we would want like the light is transitioning into hard shadow a little faster than i think i'd want it feels a lot better down here where there's more of the hard separation of elements and it's not like a soft smooth shape um but yeah i mean overall i think it it works pretty well i don't i don't really have any issue with it let me go back at the other side and look here uh, yeah, I mean, I think that the, uh, I think the light on that side is really nice and bright. I think maybe a little more of the hair on this side could also be lit a little more strongly. Like, you've got some of these pieces really popped out up here, but some of the hair down here isn't quite as lit. And it's, it's very much flaring out. And in an area, you've told me there's quite a fair amount of light through the ear and through this. So that kind of stands out as being perhaps not as bright as it could be. Um... Yeah, that's really all. I mean, this feels really good, though, overall. I like the texture. I think the metal's really selling. The micro-scratching is working for me. That's really great. The tones in the skin are really working for me. Yeah, I think this is a, this is a fantastic piece, uh, Tebow. And yeah, as a final note, I just want to draw everybody's attention to this. I think this is a really great touch. I want to draw everybody's attention to the eye and the secondary light reflection in the eye globe. I think that's it's the best thing I saw in this mini, and that's not an insult in any way. This stuff has a lot of great stuff in it, TiVo. But capturing that orange low light in the eye itself, I think, was a really great capture.
catch. So I dig that a lot. Okay, next up, Dan uh, started this in a class at Adeptcon and it sat complete for a long time. Uh, really like the freedom large scale provided. Uh, yep, very good. Uh, so let's take a look at what we've got. Uh, yeah, I think he's really fun. Uh, good use of texture on a lot of this, especially in the jeans, the leather. I think that's really nice. I think the skin could use a little bit more life and tone to it. Some of the some of the darker transitions into the shadows feel a little harsh. Like here when we look straight on, like some of our, our I mean, maybe if you're going for a very comic style, it feels very like cover of a comic book thing. So if that's what you're aiming at, cool, no issue. But like it feels like our transition goes mostly from three into five, like really hard and fast, like here under his abs uh here under his pecs like these lines are really really strong again if you're going for sort of a comic book style thing cool no issue if you're going for uh a little bit more of a traditional contrasting style then i would smooth some of that out that's really the uh, the big thing that jumps out at me a little more red tones in the skin as well he's lacking much in the way of blood beneath that skin especially for someone who's walking around all day without a shirt on uh, you know, there'd probably be a lot of blood near a surface of, of some of these things where he's getting, you know, sunburnt or something like that. So just a little bit more of the red tones in there, especially around the face, the cheeks, uh, some parts in the lower abs, you know, down here, that kind of stuff is what, uh, what stands out to me. Okay. All right. All right, Tim, uh, says uh would some blood stains or streaks on the blades make this model more visually interesting other thoughts on the conversion work and paint job uh sure you can you yeah you know, there's nothing wrong with with blood on there i think that's perfectly fine um i mean again my biggest answer for you here is going to be more contrast uh as with most things the blue skin it does not have enough like volumetric shading to it light at the top shadow at the bottom the the volumes themselves need to be picked out better also be careful when you're using washes here on stuff like his pants because it still has like some coffee staining in it and elements like that i can see that still showing so we want to make sure we smooth that out i think the head works fine i think the conversion's cool i have no issue with that i think it looks very natural so that's certainly successful and yeah you could use a little bit of like light blood staining if it's if it's sort of just use a very deep red and just some very light touches and i think that'd be cool to show that it scraped along some people no issue at all all right awesome tim Okay, next up, Chad uh, says he wanted to focus on some volumetric shading on these guys. Uh, also wanted to go for a cartoony look, so I left the color transitions without any real blending. Any feedback on that? Um, yeah, what I'll say is if you're going to do that cartoony look, you can do it with non-blended paints, but then they have to be really smoothly applied. So like here where you've got the yellow going hard into the green, that works in a cartoony style but it has to be like really cleanly smoothly applied okay now as to the volumetric shading we need to go farther so like especially on a chibi like this you want really extreme transitions all the muscles having these really dark lines and if you're going for that sort of comic book you look like you mentioned then again everything should be really well separated so like dark lines in between the various elements like hands to this bracer there's not a clean separation between them right arm to bracers here and here that kind of stuff that's where you want to really be uh pushing yourself as far as those kinds of things go so there you go but really cool hope that helps all right last up uh bartas uh eventually be able to compete for best painted at a large tournament with that in mind is there anything that you would recommend improving on for your basic troops like these ungors uh so sure if i was looking at these ungors and they were part of a larger army I would find them to be very impressive. Like they're smooth. I like the skull faces. I think that's really nice. The rust and stuff looks good. I think the wood of the arrow halves and the um, the spears could have a little bit more texture to them. That's something that would stand out to me. Again, none, like none of this is absolutely a deal breaker. Uh, I think these guys are absolutely, they, they would make a cut, that's for sure, into anything I was was judging. Because you're doing a good job of capturing a lot of tonal variation on a small model here. Uh, I would say just look at maybe a little more with things like uh, texturing and lines on things like the little more stretch on the horns with some striations. 
or on the wood, you know, where there would be really, really, really evident texture on these things. I think that's where you want to push yourself uh, a little more. But overall, I think these guys are good. Your weathering is top notch. Lots of great freehand and stuff like that. Your rust feels very organic. It's not in the places where they would have naturally stabbed and worn it off. It's a lot of great elements about these. So I think these are really, really strong, Bartas. I really do. And I hope to be back to CanCon uh, next year. We'll see if people are allowed to travel from the States or whatever. Um, if not next year, I will definitely be back the year after that. So if, if COVID would prevent, prevent the travel, I'll definitely... Uh, like, I'm not going to come to CanCon if I have to quarantine for 14 days first, so, obviously. Uh, but if I don't go in 2021, you bet your bottom dollar I would be back in 2022, and hopefully for many years to come after that. I love coming over, and I loved it, and uh, I hope to see everybody's army there and everybody there for many years to come. Uh, Australia was singularly wonderful. I loved it, and every minute of it, and I can't wait to go back. Uh, but this is great stuff, so I hope to see this whole army uh, on my judging table uh, in a year or years to come. So that brings us to the end of the month. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll say thank you everybody who submitted. Absolutely fantastically gorgeous month. So many amazing submissions this month. I was blown away by the quality. Uh, so thank you very much everybody who submitted. Uh, as always, if you want to join us on your journey, down below there is a link. Click that, answer the questions. And uh, as always, I very much appreciate you watching this one. Uh, give this a like if you liked all the people who were bold enough and brave enough to submit and get some feedback. Uh, but to everybody in the PMP who gives feedback on a daily basis, I like doing this once a month, but it's the people who are answering questions, who are providing feedback every day. They're the real heroes of the community. So keep being positive and helping your uh, fellow hobby brothers and sisters on their own hobby journey. Uh, and so with that, I say thank you very much. I appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next time.